We are live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the June 8th work session of the East Hampton Town Board. Carol, would you please read the roll call? Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez? Present. Councilman Lees? Present. Councilwoman Overby? Here. Councilman Bradman? Here. Supervisor Vance Goyax? Present. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Today's meeting will begin with a public portion where any member of the public may address the board on any matter. We ask that you please keep your comments to three minutes or less. We'll have uh, the following topics to discuss today. We have a uh, Springs Park Committee recommendations, Kathy Burke Gonzalez, Neil Kraft, and Scott Wilson. We have Fire Island to Montauk Point uh, Partnership Agreement, which John Jelnicki, the town attorney, will review with us. We have weight limitations for Akabonic Road, uh, Councilman Lee's presenting. And I have a COVID-19 response and vaccination update. That'll be followed by liaison reports, and we do have a few resolutions today, but let's go right to the public. I believe we have a caller on the line, Michael. Yes, we do. We have a caller with the last four digits ending 8764. I'll unmute that now. Hello. Hi, um, it's Carol Buda calling from Springs. As a regular user of the Springs Park since it opened, you know, I know I represent many who strongly object to cutting off a part of the existing fenced areas of Springs Park to create a small dog park. The demand for a small dog park should be created elsewhere, at least outside of the currently fenced half of this 42-acre park. Now, many of us feel that the clearing proposal to create more grasslands is an awful idea and a threat to health and safety as well as the environment. People and dogs desperately need shade on the trails in the summer and a windbreak in the winter. The last time there was a major clearing of woods, large sections of the North Trail became fully exposed to the sun and too hot for people or dogs to walk on a hot summer day. Only the South Trail now is well shaded and the proposed small dog park would interfere with that much needed usage. Removing the invasive autumn olive is one thing, but how is a complete removal of all plants to create man-made grasslands a natural or good environmental solution? Many small wildlife species live in that habitat. Native eastern red cedars would be mowed down. What is natural about destroying animal habitats to create more man-made grasslands that are periodically mowed? As it is, we don't walk the cleared eastern end of the park in extremely hot or windy frigid weather because the area is so exposed. We also don't need sight lines, in fact, just the opposite. The visual separation is a good thing for safety and for aesthetics. Most dogs walk on or near the trails with their people. You certainly don't want a dog to see another dog on the far side of the park and go running off when the human has no chance of catching up. Anyone who walks the park today will see beautiful wild roses copiously scattered in the wooded areas. All this beauty would be lost in the proposed clearing. The last time they cleared, they took the good with the bad and even unwittingly took down a specimen flowering tree that bordered the South Trail. I feel that it's just unfair and undemocratic to make major changes to this popular park when you still don't have open public meetings. I'm confident that an open public meeting would be packed with residents who want this park left as is. I just don't feel the public has been heard. I urge this board not to take away from one user group to give to another. Find another place for a small dog park. Don't take away our shade and the beauty of our park. The town spends money on playgrounds, ballparks, senior centers, and the like. You certainly could do the same for a small dog park. And you know, I want to make a note, I have two small dogs under, the, under 20 pounds each. I urge each and every board member to walk the Springs Park as soon as possible on a hot, sunny day to better understand some of these issues regarding shade, safety, foliage, and usage. Thank you. Thank you for calling us today, Carol, and letting your uh, opinions be known. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? We sure do. Moving on to the next caller, the last four digits of their phone are 7198. I'll unmute that now. 
Good morning. This is Carla Ash, a, res- a 40-year resident of Town Lane, and I'm calling regarding the weight limits that you're proposing on Akabonic and urging you to continue those weight limits up Town Lane. Uh, it's an easy turn there for trucks to get up to Town Lane. It's already a Montauk Highway bypass because of ways and Google, so we have constant traffic of people being directed. It used to be just the town people that knew. Now it's everybody who's from out of town comes and uses ways uh, to get out of my driveway now can be a constant flow of traffic um, to get out and waiting five minutes out of my driveway, which is something new. But uh, Town Lane up to Abraham's Path is what I'm talking about because that is a totally residential area. It has no sidewalk, which, by the way, I don't want, and I'm a constant walker there. And there are runners and walkers all the time going past my house and uh, with trucks, Again, no sidewalks and heavy trucks that can't stop as quickly as a car. I just beg you not to include Town Lane and not have it just up Akabonic to Town Lane. Akabonic at least does have a sidewalk. You don't have to walk on the street. Um, But the wear and tear, and there's a bend, and it goes uphill, and there have been accidents of hitting the trees because as you come off of Town Lane, there's an incline and a bend, and the police are always there. I mean, every day there's a policeman there because they know it's a problem area. And um, so uh, the other thing is it's not a problem just from Town Lane. It's a problem from Amagansett. They can get onto Town Lane from Amagansett and continue to Akabonic and then go out Akabonic with the trestle so high. So it isn't just the point of Town Lane and and, uh, Akabonic. You also have to consider the traffic coming the other way. And um, past, past Abraham's Path, of course, it's a great mix of wonderful farmland and some houses. It's a more pastoral area disappearing, but thank goodness we protected that land. But uh, So I urge you to consider both of those and also that it's both ways. So that if there's a, tan- uh, uh, a weight limit, it should also be posted perhaps at Abraham's Path or wherever you want to, but the, the space from Town Lane to Abraham's Path is strictly residential except At the end, you have a town youth park. So is that a place also for heavy trucks to be going by? I don't think so. And the stop sign there has helped a lot with slowing the traffic yet. yet. But I'd be glad to have another one at at, uh, Jenny's Path and Spring Close because that's where they speed up coming off of of Akabonic. Anyway, please, please think beyond Akabonic to help mitigate what we all knew was going to happen. We all knew it. We had discussions about this before work ever started, that there were going to be great changes in the traffic patterns. And of course, it's our neighborhoods that are deeply affected by it. Please, please consider Town Lane when you're talking about Akabonic. And I thank you. Carla, thanks so much for calling in today and uh, and your service on the East Hampton Sag Harbor CAC, where I know the topic has been discussed. Oh, glad to do it. Thank you very much. Be well. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? Yes. Moving forward, the next caller's last four digits of their phone ended 9034. I'll unmute that now. Good morning. This is Sarah Davison calling. Um, Hi, Sarah. I was happy to. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I was happy to serve on this ad hoc committee for the Springs Park, and I wanted to just make a few comments 
Um, as many of you know, I was the director of the Animal Rescue Fund for 16 years, and I was very involved in the original uh, purchase through the CPF committee, which I chaired at the time, and the uh, adoption of the management plan. So I know the park pretty well. And um, I have to say what a huge success it has been for the town. Uh, the users love this park, and of course we all love our dogs, so the, some of the feelings can run pretty high on this issue. Um, I, agree, I agreed to serve on the park committee because um, I thought there is, in the over 10 years since the management plan was adopted, we've really seen how it can be used and what any issues have developed over those o over 10 years. So our committee uh, seriously looked at the park and met with this wonderful town staff and um, came up with a few minor suggestions. And I think our main message to the board is that our suggestions are minor. Uh, we, the, the park is functioning you know, quite well. But signages definitely need to be improved. Um, we need better compliance with pickup. And we hope the signage and more trained uh, volunteers will help with that. Um, the, the one change that we're proposing that is not in the management plan is the small dog park area. And, and a number of the park committee interviewed people who would really like to use the park, but um, they're, they're leery and uh, unsure about how their small dogs would fare. And I do understand that. And so we therefore um, walked the site and, and figured out a place where the small dog park could go. You know, this is a proposal. Maybe it can be finessed. But the argument that there's not enough room for a small dog park at this area is, is uh, pretty astonishing. I, I would like to hope that dog users would support each other and help each other accommodate uh, everybody's needs here at this wonderful park. I think there's plenty of room at the park for all types of dog uses, including a small, small dog area. Um, so. Those are my comments. Thank you for your consideration. Look forward to working with you in the future on this wonderful park. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. We appreciate your comments very much. Be well. Moving Michael, on. we have any other callers? Yes, moving on. The next caller's last four digits end in 2777. I'll unmute now. Hi, this is Morgan Vaughn calling. How are you all today? Hi, Morgan. How are you? I'm good. I'm calling on behalf of myself and my husband and my family as citizens, nothing to do with LTV. Um, I live in Akabonic Road, and I fully support this um, initiative to restrict the weight limit, and especially if we can't do anything about the speed of which people are traveling. Um, I grew up in the house that we live in now. I've lived here my entire life, and I am scared to death to have my nieces and nephews and my son in the past cross the street to get to the sidewalk. This is, this is um, the history of the house and the history of the neighborhood is a working class neighborhood. It started in the 20s and 30s. It is for, it has a sidewalk going all the way to Floyd and beyond, I think maybe even to the, um, the housing. And it's just really, really frustrating when we have, now that we've had this, um, the trestle lifted, trucks can just fly by. And we've already had one dog that, that was killed, I think, a couple years ago. I'm scared to death to let my dogs out. My nieces and nephews are visiting this week. And just even just them crossing in front of my house makes me have agita. It is a residential neighborhood, and I don't think people really understand that as much. It actually used to be called, and Hugh King can correct me, but it was called Lily Hill Road until Akabonic and Floyd, and then it became, at some point in the 50s, it was called um, Akabonic all the way to 27. Um, so anyway, that's what I would love to see this go through. I would love to see some help for the residents of this piece of Akabonic who live here year-round, who have kids, who have dogs, and I would love to have some help. Thanks for taking the time to call us today, Morgan. We appreciate your comments. OK, great. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Michael, do you have any other callers on? Yes, moving on. The next caller's last four digits of their phone end in 7741. I'll unmute that now.
Hello, caller with the last four digits ending in 7741. Are you there? Yes, hello. Hi, you're live. Can with you the hear town. me? Yes, please state your name. Hi, I'm Mr. Katz. I live in Springs, and I have a couple of issues with the recommendations made by the committee on the Springs Park. I don't understand what kind of survey they did of the people who use the park. Um, it seems to me from people I've spoken to, the majority of people don't want any changes to the park at all. And while I thoroughly sympathize with those people who are concerned about their small dogs, this is the only place in the entire area that large dogs can run unleashed. On the other hand, there could be a smaller area cut out from many other locations for small dogs, um, which I would support wholeheartedly. I'm also troubled by the lack of transparency on the part of this Springs Park Committee. I don't know what kind of study they did. I don't have any knowledge of any survey they did of park users uh, or why they came to the conclusions that they did. So I would ask for a bit more transparency and a bit more input from the community that uses the park before any recommendations are made. And I really thank you for your time. Thank you very much for calling. And that is, in fact, the purpose for having uh, this work session agenda discussion later today. Um, we appreciate hearing from all the public. Thank you. Take care. Moving on, the next caller's last four digits end in 0349. I'll unmute that now. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Teresa Collins. I live in Springs near the park. I've managed the Facebook group called Springs, quote, dog, close quote, park for nine years. What Carol Buda said at the top of this meeting is truth. I would add there is no proven need to change this park. The evidence-based recommendations are absent from this committee report. Indeed, it misrepresents the results of even its own informal survey on the Facebook group mentioned above. Respondents in that survey said three, two, one, there is no need for a small dog designated area in this park. Many will resist the introduction of new fencing within this park. The consensus is to leave it as is and for the town council to respect the open space and community preservation principles of the 2009 plan. I will make a prediction to you based on experience since November when this issue started percolating, or shall I say, raining down on us, making unwarranted change to the park and its management plan will now, and 60 years from now, be met with a simple refrain. Change Town Council, not Springs Park. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Appreciate your call. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? Yes, moving forward, the next caller's last four digits of their phone are 1723. I'll unmute that now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Todd Braun. I'm a resident over on Akbonic Road, right on the uh, bend at the top of the hill. Um, thank you for taking your time with this matter, and thank you for your work as a board and uh, what you all do for the town. Um, I just want to voice uh, my concern about the uh, traffic uh, since the raising of the train trestle um, uh, at the top of Akabonic Road. Um, I'm a resident of 20 years here. My uh, family has been over 50 years out here, um, and I've greatly seen this road change um, throughout those years that I've been here. I have kids. Um, on Fortunately, uh, within the past five years, 
traffic started increasing. Like, I, we got to keep our kids off the road. I was listening to Morgan before, my neighbor down the road. Um, basically, uh, I could re- reiterate all of her statements. Um, we lost the dog on the road already. Um, the road is not designed for what is happening on there with the speed and with the trucks. Uh, I'd say about three years ago, we had a car flip, uh, hit a tree, and flip over right in front of my driveway. Um, over there, I think the uh, driver was okay. But um, that was just the eye-opener. And then once the train trestle got lifted, that traffic has increased tenfold coming down. And I must say, particularly the truck traffic, uh, Unfortunately, it is local companies that are redirecting to say three minutes from going through North Main Street to get out of Springs um, that we've noticed the most. But um, you have a lot of houses that are pretty quite close to the roadway, and God forbid any of those trucks did have a brake issue or whatnot or uh, needed to veer. There's really no place to veer away to. Um, without creating uh, damage to property and or uh, pedestrian uh, life if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, The three-way stop has helped um, mitigate some of the traffic uh, and the issues that we're having at the beginning of last summer, and thank you for changing that. Uh, It seems to be a little less confusing at that intersection, but uh, I, I really feel that the weight limit uh, reduction would uh, greatly help, as well as, as I'd like to say, eco down to 25 miles an hour. And hopefully, ways will stop pointing people back into this road um, as it does going south of the highway, and where all those roads that are a clear access way from the uh, left hand turn at the pond to get you past uh, east of Amagansett. All the, those roads south of the highway are weight limited, I believe, and low speed limited, 25 miles an hour. I think we would be should be entitled to the same privilege of having that on the residential road. Um, and that's about it. But uh, again, thank you for your time with all of this. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate you calling in. Okay. Be well. Moving on, the next caller's last four digits of their phone end in two four six two. I'll unmute that caller now. Uh, yes, hi. Good morning, board members. My name is Charles Keller, and I've lived on Akabonic Road for the past 29 years. I just wanted to read a brief comment. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for addressing our petition concerning the relentless noise caused by large and oversized truck traffic between Floyd and Collins Avenue. Since the raising of, a tre- of the trestle, our community on Akabonic Road has experienced a severe increase of heavy truck traffic and noise. It's had a highly negative effect on the quality of life in our neighborhood. These large and oversized trucks barrel up and down Akabonic from early morning into well at night with no current restriction. In addition, we are concerned about added pollution and the safety of the many children pedestrians, joggers, and bikers who use Akabonic within this densely populated neighborhood. Prior to the trestle being raised, oversized trucks utilized various routes to get to their destinations without issue. Previously, the trestle was a natural barrier for larger trucks, even though sometimes uh, they tried to get through. (laughs) Now, Akabonic seems to have become their main route of transport. Our petition was established as a result of our community coming together to address the rising concern about the daily assault on the quality of life and peace in our neighborhood. We look for your leadership and strongly ask for your support in helping us resolve this highly important issue. Thank you for your time. Charles, thank you for calling. Be well. Thank you. Moving on, the next caller, the last four digits of their phone are 0601. I'll unmute that now. Uh, hi, my name is Barbara Feldman. Uh, I believe most people know my dogs, the Afghan hounds. Excuse me, Barbara. A part Barbara, of can we, just, yes. Barbara, can you mute the uh, TV in the background so that we don't get a feedback? 
Yeah. Yeah, what's happening is I'm speaking, and then what's happening online seems – I'm hearing people on the phone, and then what I see online is following it. So there's like a, a, a wait, and it's very hard to uh, coordinate the two. But I can speak yeah, you, if that you happens, turn off, works. You need, I don't to know turn off, you need to turn off the device and just talk on the phone. I need to turn off the phone? No, your device. The TV or whatever you're watching on. Do I need? To... I'll turn that off. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes, Barbara. If I could just interject. Excuse me, Barbara. This is Mike, the director at the TV station. Yes. Simply turn off the device right. that's playing the video in your in your room. Turn off your computer or your television and simply okay. communicate only through the telephone. Okay. So is this better now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. All right, Continue. I'll start again. All Please. Right. All right. Yes. I start speaking. Please continue. Okay. My name is Barbara Feldman, and I have been part of the Springs Park since its very inception. Uh, I go there pretty much every day. My dogs are large. Um, they are active. They love to run. They are social. Uh, they they do come on strong when they see a dog, but they're not aggressive or nasty. They just want to play. I have hundreds of pictures of my dogs at the park playing with, very nicely, little dogs. Many times I have said to small dog owners, are your dogs afraid of big dogs? Oh, no. My dogs love big dogs. Um, I, I really think it's not a dog, the dog problem. I think it's an owner fear problem that something might happen where, I mean, over the time, I, I just don't see the documentation for, for um, you know, problems or, 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 or issues at the dog park. If somebody wants to have a small dog area, that is fine. However, not at the expense of a gate, which is used uh, Frequently, if we have a, a double gate on one side, we have a single gate on the other, and it is very important to maintain those two areas of entrance, entrance and egress because it's, it facilitates uh, less confrontation, which typically does, if anything does happen, it's at the front because dogs are anxious to get in, people are sitting there with their dogs, they're playing, they're waiting to get out, and it makes it much, much easier. I cannot discern from the plan where that proposed small dog area is, but if, in fact, there is to be one, let's put it in a place with a separate entrance so those people with small dogs can go there. I don't really see uh, any any problem. I have been a part of this committee uh, ostensibly, but I have not been uh, included in almost anything, but I do not recall hearing anybody talk about having a survey at the park or, or questioned. So I'm really sort of wondering where this information is coming from or where this proposed, you know, supposed need for a small dog area is coming from. Uh, I think we need to look at the numbers of people who want to keep this, this park the way it is, which is the most wonderful place that I've ever come across and probably one of the main reasons that I haven't moved from East Hampton. But um, I, I, I do think that, you know, having small dogs versus big dogs, particularly if you're going to base it on weight, is kind of, you know, unnecessary at this point. My dogs are very tall. They weigh nothing because they're skin and bones. And yet there are many smaller dogs who who are more muscular and actually outweigh my dogs. So if you're going to do it based on size, I, I can't even understand how that would be applied. Can't we just leave the park the way it is? People love it there. It's a wonderful place to interact for dogs, for people, for big dogs, for little dogs. It all. I'm happy to supply photos of, of dogs playing together, whatever you need. But... So don't, don't fix what's not broken. That's all I have to say. Please leave it. Thank you. Thank you for calling, Barbara. Be well. Michael, we have the other callers. 
Yes, moving on, the next caller's last four digits end in 1086. I'll unmute that now. Hi, this is uh, Richard Green. I'm a resident, longtime resident of the uh, Springs and Gardner Avenue. Been here for 30 years. Have both a uh, large and a small dog, um, and we use the park every day, uh, and have been using it every day for about 30 years. Um, and you know, we we talk. I've never had any problem as a, with a large and a small dog. I've never had any problems with our dogs or other dogs. Um, uh, and I think we, for, we, you know, we refer to it as a as a dog park, but it, it's actually a people park. It's so much more than a than a than a dog park. It, it you know, thanks to the board and thanks thanks very much also for the opportunity to to share these comments. Uh, it, it it's a blessed space. Space, uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a space to meet people, exchange ideas, um, 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 get get a contractor. Uh, so uh, you know, we we hope that that it it, it 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 that you are able to to maintain the the, the space as it is, and and we get to experience the, the joy of the of, of the park as it is. Probably a far greater concern of ours is is getting to the park and uh, let, letting the dogs um, the fear of the, of letting the dogs out of the house and. I'm finding their way to either Gardner Avenue or Three Mile Harbor Road uh, because of the uh, the extraordinary uh, aggressive, aggressiveness of of drivers and and the speed on those roads. So, um, th th thanks for having this meeting and thanks for giving us an opportunity to, to to share a few words with you. Richard, our pleasure. We appreciate you letting us know what you think. Be well. Moving on, the next caller's last four digits end in 7427. I'll unmute that now. Hi, uh, good morning, still morning. This is Katie Casey. I'm calling in regarding the weight limit on Akabonic Road for truck traffic. I'm calling to support weight limits. It's not only uh, you know the, um, the size and the speed, but uh, there are several spots in the road where there are a lot of hidden driveways and there's absolutely no shoulder. So um, it's not just a nuisance, but it's actually, in my opinion, a health and safety issue having large trucks using Akabonic to bypass 27. You can hear them coming up Akabonic in the morning and they're uh, struggling to upshift and um, then in the afternoon, you can hear them all going back down southwest, and they hit their Jake break when they get to the intersection. It's like every day's Groundhog Day. They're always surprised when they hit the stop sign at Town Lane, and it's pop, 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 pop. So um, anyway, that's it. I just wanted to call and support this legislation. David, I thank you for looking into the matter and following through, and I thank the town board for uh, taking this under consideration. Thanks for calling us today, Katie. Bye. You well. Moving on to the next caller. The last four digits of this caller's phone end in 0553. Uh, we just lost them, actually. So mm -hmm. uh, at this time, there are no new callers. If that previous caller comes in at a later time, I'll let you know. OK, we'll go ahead then with our um, the topics and of course the first topic today is the Springs Park Committee recommendations. Councilwoman Kevin Berg Gonzalez and Neil Kraft and Scott Wilson are all here with us to discuss the committee's recommendations. Kathy? Start, Kathy. Yeah, so Scott's gonna start on start us off. All right. So I want to thank the board for uh, having us in today to propose some modest safety improvements at Springs Park. In the late fall of 2020, our department was notified that deer had been spotted in the park, and since the 22 acres of park is fenced, it would be very unlikely for the deer to find their way out without provocation. While working with a number of volunteers, including those from Group for Wildlife, we made a significant effort to walk the park from back to front to flush the deer forward and out the open vehicle gate. After hours of searching, the dogs still in the park found him first, and unfortunately the deer was killed. Two days later, we were notified there was a second deer in the park. We closed the park. We actually closed the park on both occasions. 
and we physically crawled through the very dense invasive vegetation in search, but we discovered the second deer had met the same fate. Now, I only relate this story not as a comment on deer or dogs, but it was the impetus and our department's observations actually crawling through this dense invasive vegetation that we made a recommendation to the town board on November 12, 2020, that the vegetation in the park was simply too dense for users to see and control their dogs, which is one of the primary rules of the park. Although we did make a significant effort back in 2009 to remove autumn olive and other invasives, we were only able to reclaim three sections of the former nursery area as opposed to the six that were actually called for in the adopted management plan. At that time, uh, there was significant opposition to more restoration of the park to a more natural state, I believe primarily because the removal and cutting, it does appear destructive. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's no other way to put it. You're removing invasive species in favor of a natural or native vegetation. The three areas that we do cut have a much healthier grassland population, one in which bluebirds and other bird species seem to appreciate. Therefore, our department's primary recommendation had been to follow through with the adopted management plan for a restoration of native species, which can both increase native habitat and increase visibility for the safety of all users. There were other safety concerns which will be addressed later. And Kathy, do you want to explain what happened with the town board from that point forward? Sure, sure. So, you know, Scott mentioned back in November of last year, his department brought to our attention that there were safety issues. And I had responded to everyone that I was going to take this matter to the Springs CAC, which we did. And we had a big meeting in January. We had over 90 folks participate. Uh, you know, I know that there was some criticism because if you weren't a committee member, you, you had to be muted because there was it was very difficult to manage such a big meeting. But what came out of that was that we were going to form a, a Sparks, a Springs Park committee to get input to see how we could address these safety issues. So I put forward a resolution back in February uh, 18th. It was unanimously adopted by the board. We then put out a doodle poll to all of the uh, folks that had expressed interest in participating and uh, we needed a daytime meeting because we wanted Scott at our meetings and Andy Gates when he was available since those folks are uh, taking care of the park for the community. So we met three times on, in a Zoom call. We had an on-site meeting there and uh, Neil is here today. He was the chair of the committee. Sarah Davison served as the secretary of the committee. And, uh, you know, I'd like, like, I'd like Neil to make his presentation now to the board. Thank you, Kathy, and welcome, Neil. Hi, thanks for uh, having me. Um, I don't quite know how this all happened um, in terms of the calls and stuff. Um, there's a lot of misinformation going around, which I guess shouldn't surprise anyone. But what I'm going to try to do is just go through what we proposing um, based on certainly no survey and 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 certainly uh, uh, there was no uh, attempt to uh, democratize the process. We were asked, you know, what are the things that uh, could make the park safer for everyone, uh, dogs, humans, and uh, deer. And we came up with a few what we thought were um, minor, uh, with the possible exception of the small dog area, changes to the park that we thought would help the safety of it. Um, I will take you through my presentation again, only to clear up some of the misinformation. Um, and then, uh, you know, I would rather just, if anybody has any comments, I don't know what the format is, but I would rather do it after <laughs> I've shown what we want to do uh, than before we've even had a chance to speak. Um, so, please do go forward with the presentation and we'll hold questions till the end. So, Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we were asked to, uh, uh, you know, take a look at what's going on in the park. There is a lot of hot-blooded um, uh, uh, talk about it. And to Scott's point, a big part of the park is overgrown. This is a shot of my dog, Biggie, who loves the dog, the park very much and goes uh, uh, 14 times a week. Um, so what was our goal? Uh, 
we just want to make the park slightly safer and a more pleasant experience for everyone. For dog owners, park users, and this is very important, not everyone has a dog, uh, the dogs, and those who have to care for the park. Uh, to Scott's point, um, you know, if something goes wrong, there's a lot of dense underbrush. Uh, and also to that point, we do not want to get rid of the shade. My wife is as pale as a, uh, a, 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 I can't, a potato, and nobody wants to get rid of the, the shade. It is my favorite thing in the world. Uh, so who we spoke to, and this again seems to be a bit controversial, but we did not poll. Um, we spoke to people, we spoke to park users, not scientifically, dog safety experts, uh, three or four. Um, uh, we did informal, completely unscientific polling on Facebook and Nextdoor, but that was everyone's uh, opportunity to make any comments that, that we wanted to, uh, uh, you know, that they wanted us to address. Um, I spent quite a bit of time um, on the phone with East Hampton Town Animal Control. I think her name's Helen, sorry. Um, but she has very strong opinions about the park in general and uh, not a fan, but I really wanted to get her point of view. Uh, we talked to Kathy Burke Gonzalez, Scott Wilson, and Andrew Gates. All of them have a great deal of experience trying to maintain the park and trying to maintain the people in the park. Um, there is a common saying among uh, dog people that it's not the dogs, it's the owners, and we tend to agree. Uh, and lastly, we took a really hard look at this, uh, the, the Springs Park management plan, um, which we think is excellent. And we think the rules are, are really well thought out. And as Sarah said, they're 10 years old. So are there a few small things we can do to update them? Um, some of you may be aware that there are a lot more people out here than there were 10 years ago, um, and that there are a great many pandemic puppies, and every one of those pandemic puppies has landed um, in the dog park. So it has made for um, some challenging situations. I personally, and again, this is not scientific, I know three people who've had their legs broken and three or four dogs who've been seriously damaged there. So we want, the park open. We are lovers of the park. I am the park's biggest fan, but we want to try to make it safer. And of course, we spoke to the dogs who had a whole lot to say about this. So here are our recommendations. Again, with the exception of the small dog area, these are all pretty much in the plan. Uh, based in a large part on the current plan. All right, create more grassland. So this, this was misrepresented. Um, and, and I think Scott explained it better. We don't want to get rid of either the shade or the big trees. We want to get rid of one section of the, the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but um, there were six planned sections that, that were to be um, cleared for three reasons, uh, as I understand them. One is invasive species. The autumn olives um, and uh, other, um, there's one other invasive species that I can't remember are taking over the park because it was once a uh, uh, it was once a, a nursery. So we simply want to uh, continue to manage the invasive species um, and clear some of the underbrush. Um, and I have to disagree with people who think that um, the underbrush is necessarily good because uh, there are really only uh, there are a couple of places that that accidents happen. And one of them is when the dogs are, are not, um, uh, you're not able to see the dogs or for that matter in Scott's uh, uh, situation, the deer. Um, so here's the original um, uh, uh, plan from the dog park, no changes. Again, I don't think people are reading this right. We want in the entire 21 acres, we want to bring back grassland in one other area, which uh, is, uh, 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 pointed out by the red sign. We do not want to get rid of the shade. I'm a big fan of shade. We want to help Scott and 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 uh, you know animal control manage the park. Um, and in order to do that, uh, the less dense underbrush, the better. Um, so again, this is the original plan, and we simply want to restore that one area. Okay. I don't think this is a controversial subject, but I'll discuss it. Um, there are rules to the park, um, a great many of which um, 
uh, 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 are violated every single day. Um, and nobody wants to be the, 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 the police uh, at the park. Um, but they were well thought out and uh, they are in the management plan. So we, again, absolutely are making no changes to the rules for the management plan. We do think that signage is a problem. There's a couple of problems. One, people don't read signs. This is what the current sign looks like with, with the rules. Now, I actually have a career in, in, in art direction and I can tell you that's not a readable sign. Um, in fact, a great many people, um, when I asked at the park if anybody read the sign, I consistently got a what sign. So um, we simply wanna take these existing rules and clean them up. Uh, Scott and I have worked on this together. We simply want a great big sign with um, each of the, the, the already existing rules made very clear. We've included um, infographics because some of you may know that there are people in, um, in the Hamptons who don't speak English and we would like uh, uh, it to be clear to everyone. Uh, so the rules as stated are watch and control your dogs, bring a leash and use it at the first sign of aggressive behavior or other problem. Leash your dog during entry or exit to the park. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that in a bit, but that there are two problem areas in the park. The entry and the exit of the park is one of them. Somebody was talking about the entrance of the park being blocked off by the small dogs area. That is not what's happening. Um, so I'll explain that in a bit. Keep the dog park clean. It's mandatory to, to discard waste. No aggressive or contagious dogs or dogs in heat. That this gets violated virtually every day. Everybody who owns a dog thinks they're perfect. Um, and Unfortunately, there are aggressive dogs there. No food. Now, this is in the original plan, but we really feel strongly that food creates a problem at the dog park. And um, I've seen it over and over again where dogs are following the wrong person because they have food. Obviously, training treats are okay, but we don't want food in the park. It's a safety issue. The dogs must be licensed and have a collar with ID. And uh, we want people to respect the other users of the park, the joggers, the bird watchers, et cetera. It is a wonderful resource for the town. And once again, I thank the town very much for having it. Uh, the first 10 years I lived out here, I didn't know about it. Um, someone said they'd used the park for 30 years, but my understanding is that it's only been around for about 10, but uh, I could be wrong. We've also given people the emergency numbers uh, quite clearly here. So we just essentially going from this to this. Uh, that's that change. Um, okay, the small dog area. We think out of the 20, to be clear about the small dog area reasoning, what I heard over and over again from people, and again, not scientific, is that it's not so much small dogs. In fact, I was at first on the fence about the small dog area. I think Sarah was one of the people who brought this up, but I do know people who've been run down on those big paths. The dogs get excited. They start to run together. They, they, they you know, I, my wife has been knocked over. Uh, uh, Ronnie Miller Manning had her leg broken. Sorry to call her out. We know about the problem. So the reason for the small dog fenced in area, which is 1 20th of the entire park. And again, if people don't want it, we're fine. And these are recommendations, not a demand. Uh, is for me more so that people who are afraid of being knocked over by a running pack of small dogs, including um, Afghan hounds that I've seen knock people over, um, would go here. And it's a, meant to be a resting place for people um, with both small dogs and who are afraid of, of, of the charging big dogs. And that's it. Now, if you look, uh, the fence was brought up. Um, okay, so the the major problem area, um, and, and, and to Scott's point uh, uh, at the park, is the, the, the gates. Um, we have one double gate, which we are not proposing we get rid of. Um, in fact, we think it's important that all the gates be double gates. Um, the reasons are twofold. One, dogs, again, the proper rule is you're supposed to keep your dog on, on a leash till they get into the park, nobody does. So they're threatened when they get to a dog park and there are a bunch of dogs hanging out in the front barking at them. That is the problem point. I have seen it a hundred times. The only other major change that we're asking for is that we have self-closing 
um, double gates uh, in all three places instead of just one. Now, you can see in this detail here, somebody said we're taking away the double gate. We are not taking away the double gate. And this was just Andy's attempt at a rough drawing, but we want the double gate to work for both the small dog um, area and uh, the rest of the park. Um, this is a, I, I feel quite strongly about the double gates, uh, particularly because as Andy and Scott have pointed out, and I have seen, the gates get left open because they're not even self-closing. And that's how the, the, the deer got in and they will continue to get in unless we have self-closing gates. Uh, install additional trash cans and poop bags, um, which has been completed thanks to uh, Kathy Burke Gonzalez and uh, the Parks Department. Um, it, it made a, a big, huge difference uh, in terms of uh, people getting to the end of the park and discovering that they didn't have dogs, uh, doggy bags. And um, we feel it's already helped to clean up the park. So we thank um, uh, Kathy Burke Gonzalez and the, uh, uh, the parks department for adding those uh, cans. Uh, this is a rough one, but we do think that, that every area of the Hamptons is, is, is very well policed. Uh, somebody mentioned on, you know, there's always police, uh, uh, waiting around Akabonic Lane. We all know the places that there are police. Everybody knows about beaches and lifeguards. Uh, there is someone who uh, uh, occasionally visits the beach to make sure that nobody is, uh, uh, no dogs are, are, are uh, molesting uh, protected birds. We think that, um, and I, I, I'm sure that the, 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 the animal control office is, is overworked, but we think that we would like them to visit occasionally on a unscheduled basis, not as police people, but simply to remind people of what the rules of the park are and to have, so that they can have in the back of their mind, well, you know, there might be somebody here. I better just watch my dog. Um, you know, I know nobody's gonna like this, but we feel that just the same way we have parking uh, violation people in the, in the um, beach parking lots that an occasional visit to the dog park would not be a bad thing. Uh, okay, create more grasslands. Uh, uh, here, here's our conclusion. Again, create more grasslands is marked on the original plan. Create two large simplified rule signs mounted prominently, one in the front and one in the back. Uh, create a small dog area. Again, the small dog area is a misnomer. Let's just call it a safety area, a one acre safety area, which would really be the only dog area. This is the Springs Park. It is not, as someone said, the Springs Dog Park. Um, so by creating a small dog area, we hope to relieve some of the issues that have been created in the rest of the Springs Park. Uh, add one double self-closing gate and keep existing one. Um, additional trash and poop bags, uh, have animal troll visit occasionally. Um, that's it for me. I'd like to thank everyone who helped us and uh, apologize to anybody who's offended by our suggestions. These are non-binding suggestions to the board. And uh, we look forward to a uh, discussion of any of them. Neil, thank you very much for the presentation and serving as chair on the Springs Park Committee. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the review and recommendations. And uh, at this point, we have an opportunity for council people to ask any questions or make comments. Anyone have any questions or comments? Kathy, how many people served on the committee? Uh, a dozen. A dozen, around twelve. Okay. There were there there were two people, including some callers, who were on the committee that didn't show. Okay. Well, I know that you. We heard from uh, Sarah Davidson, who who uh, had long experience with animal rescue by the Hamptons, and knows her way around dogs and and uh, open space as well, having served on the CPF and, and what now now works through George Prince of George Capon Foundation. Um, you know, I think it's without a doubt one of the most cherished locations probably in Springs for the community um, and particularly those who own dogs. And while the property was never envisioned as a dog park, it's kind of over the years become something of a de facto dog park just by virtue of being fenced right from the inception of our acquisition as town, uh, being that it was a former nursery and the fences were there to keep the deer out and protect the nursery stock. So, you know, I know that um, 
it's one of the few places where a uh, somewhat controlled environment can uh, facilitate uh, dogs um, exercising, running about, and I know how beloved it is. So, um, you know, I, it, I'm not surprised in the least that uh, we heard a number of callers today expressing opinions about it. I'm sure there are dozens of more different opinions uh, running the gamut. Uh, so uh, this is a great opportunity for us to review and discuss publicly the uh, recommendations of the committee. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you bringing it forward and, and dealing with some of those questions that came up, Kathy. I know um, in the past there have been uh, several occasions at which the invasives have been addressed in the park. And sometimes it's jarring to those who don't understand the management plan and the interest in removing the non-native vegetation to really try to restore a more natural um, native grassland and, and uh, area that uh, really supports native wildlife and native plant species. So um, education of, of uh, what the goals of the management plan are all, always a big part of any effort that we undertake. And uh, so I think there's likely to be a uh, more discussion going forward on this topic and more of a chance for people to understand uh, what it is that we're actually talking about here today uh, before moving forward. I would say though, I would like us to move forward with the signs. I think that that's, it's important that we simplify the signs. I think that, that Scott and Neil and the committee did a great job and I know a lot of thought went into it and a lot of discussion. And I don't know if we could possibly pull the sign up again. It's a, I don't know. Uh, sure. Okay. I, mean, yeah. I, will agree, I will agree that when uh, Neil put up the slide of the existing sign versus <laughs> the one that uh, is being proposed, um, clear and concise and direct, always welcome in a sign, um, conveys the messaging. Yeah, that, that and, is, yep, there we go. Night, night and day, night and day. I, I support that uh, request and approve the signs as well. So, so how many signs were recommended? Were there two? Well, we're, we're recommending one at the front and one at the back, which are the two sort of pressure areas. Okay. Uh, if, if the town would like more or users would like more, you know, you don't want to clutter up the park, but at least one in the front and one in the back. And what are you recommending a size? Um, Scott's been printing them out. We're, we're, we're recommending that it be as big as possible. Right. Okay. I, I, I would suggest that too. I don't know what that number is, but as big as possible. I took a look at the uh, beach rule signs and, 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 you know, they are, are, they don't look anything like this. They're closer. They're not this, but they're, they're, they're closer to this. Yes. Yeah. Any other board members want to weigh in on the sign issue? I support the sign. Yeah, I support moving forward with that. I would, even, I would even look into seeing maybe we, if we could add in a, a you know, uh, a QR code that would take us to that section of the town code. Also, if we're going to design any new signs, that might be an appropriate small little section where individuals can also, uh, you know, just quickly go there using technology. Well, yeah, and I think the QR code could also offer um, information about the management plan itself and what the goals of the park and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, have been. I like the sign. Um, I don't agree that it should be as big as possible. I like signs to be smaller. This one is excellent. It's got nice graphics. I really uh, applaud uh, Neil on this. Um, and clear, uh, clearly, he's got a background in communication. I don't think we need it to be. It's so readable and clear. Uh, I don't want to see a, a really big sign on that park. I just want to see it large enough so that you can read it. What size were we talking about? Two feet by two feet. So that's, that's not you. Okay. Yep. Not too big, not too small. Right. That's Just right. Idea. The Goldilocks sign. Um, I, I, I have a like uh, the color. I like the black and white of it. I, I, if that's part of the sign, I think the sign yes. at Springs Park is too dull and he, it doesn't pop in any way. So, yeah, that that's too dull. <laughs> so yeah, I would go with the, I like the black and white and I think that would be a, a also worthy of making sure the colors are readable. Black and white, no gray areas. 
No gray areas here. I have some questions or, or comments I wanted to ask Neil. Um, uh, how how big is the uh, the grass the grass area that you're looking at uh, to you know to to uh, take out vegetation and turn into just a grass area? How, and how big is it in acreage? Uh, I think it's about two acres because if you look at the and, and Andy or Scott could probably answer that better. But um, if you look at the proposed one acre dog uh, small dog area, it, it's about double that. And it's only one of the, the six that were originally cleared. I, I'm not sure if I was reading the um, uh, the diagram of the park uh, correctly. I, I wasn't sure, you know, where the, the gates were, were the entry okay, gates on, on the right side. Yeah, hold on. OK. So are they are the could you put the two long uh, rectangular views that you had? Yeah, is, is, are the, where's the entrance? Is it on the left or the right? Well, it's on my left, assuming that your screen isn't flip. Um, it's right there, it says entrance gate um, yeah. on my left. I, I really can't. It's on our left too. It's on our left, okay. Our yeah. Left. I sent okay. you these maps, you should have this, you got it Friday afternoon. If it's easier to look on your phone, then yeah, look I, on I, I know, I know. Thank you. I appreciate that. So if you um, look, now I skip down to, so if you so, imagine. So as you enter, as you enter, it's on the, make a right turn. That's the area. As yeah. you enter through the gate and the right turn. Okay. Yeah. I, I just wanted to know uh, where that was. I, I would say that um, I'm okay with the signage. I'm okay with, uh, a, a I guess you're talking about putting in a new third gate, right? A new brand new third gate. Well, it's not. No, a there's gate, actually an existing gate that's not a double gate. Yeah. Um, there are two existing gates that are, or again, already on the management plan. They're simply not a, a, a double gate. So really, we're not putting any new gates in. We're just oh, okay. Okay. To be I was, okay. I, I didn't read the the map correct. Yeah, I'm I'm familiar with the two gates. Yeah, I like the double door gates. I think uh, that's a good idea. I like, uh, I don't oppose the dog board and visiting occasionally either. I think it's perfectly fine. Um, I really uh, think that when you talk about a resting area, there already is a resting area in this park. As you walk down toward the far end, um, whether you come from the sides or just walk down the middle, that whole area at the end is a resting area. It's got places to sit and it tends to be a calmer area. Um, I've never seen any problem with small dogs. I oppose creating a small dog uh, area here. Um, I just don't see a need for it. And frankly, I'm. this is one instance where I am much less enthusiastic about removing uh, the amount of vegetation that you want to remove here. And it's partly um, just an acknowledgement that this land has never been uh, you know, in its natural state. It's always been a nursery. We acquired it as such. And I have to say, it is one of the most beautiful parks we have. And some of the things that I like about it are exactly what you want to get rid of. It twists and it turns and there's dense underbrush, which I have never had a problem with. Uh, you know, I have two different kinds of dogs there. One big, one I would call small, um, but not not portable, but a small dog. Um, and the paths twist and turn, and especially as you get toward the far end of the park and you make a left turn or a right turn to get into that resting area, it uh, views open up around these curves that are just stunning and they're surprising. And, and it has a very interesting, uh, it's not the topography, but the vegetation makes all the views very interesting. And I've gone there, I'm, I'm sure you do too, Neil, uh, you know, in the dead of winter, I go there when it's freezing mm -hmm. cold and it is still a stunningly beautiful park. And yes, I, I just, I don't think, you know, that every location is an appropriate location to try to take back to the days of the pioneers. Um, you know, we have a lot of Russian olives all over the place. Um, we, you know, Amagansett Amag in the dunes has a ton of Russian olives. And I just, I, I think this is a case of it ain't broke and don't fix it. And I also, you know, early on, uh, I mentioned to Kathy, as she described her Zoom meetings, um, uh, that 
you know, while you may have had members of the public on the Zoom meetings, they weren't permitted to talk. And her answer was, well, there was some messaging going on. But um, and Neil, actually, I thank you for your candor and saying, you know, you didn't really do any surveying and you did not really make an effort to democratize the, pro the process. I think that's uh, candid and I appreciate that. Um, but it strikes me as, you know, top down decision making and it, it almost reverses what I think the process should be. Uh, because it seems to me on a park that's as beloved and used as this, the first step uh, should have, I don't have any problem with forming a committee, um, you know, and coming up with recommendations. I'm not critical of that. But I really think the first step is always got to be open in this kind of a situation where you have a cohesive group of people using the park is to get them into town board and, and you know, talk it out and see what they think the problems are. Um, I'm not that impressed about the episodes with the deer. Um, you know, I know folks uh, who have, you know, sort of more, more glamorous property than I have where they've, you know, diligently uh, fenced out the deer and they are going to get into a park occasionally. That's just something that happens out here. And I don't think it's a reason to change the way we run this park. Um, I don't think there's a need for a small dog park here. I don't, one of the one of the great things about this is if you ever go to a dog park in New York City, all they are is grass and fencing. That, and I think that's what a lot of people think of as a dog park. Um, and the Springs Park is a magnificent unfenced park that's really expansive in 22 acres. And it's, you know, I think it's a little cavalier to say, well, there's 22 acres. What's an acre more or less? I don't want to see fences in this park. This park is stunning i've walked every inch of it i love every inch of this park i walk it without without my dogs frankly yeah. um i just think it's 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 it, i just think it should stay the way it is um, i don't think there's any reason to change Jeff, it for giving us your your opinion on what the dog park should be um i i do think that this is the, the way that we have a democratic process and discussion uh with the public this is uh convening committees um, to look at issues, particularly when we already have an adopted uh, management plan that's gone through a hearing process. Um, you know, it's important to occasionally review the use of properties and we do that on a regular basis. Uh, this, as I see it, is just the beginning of uh, what a public process would include. Um, we're not making decisions uh, in a top-down way, but I do believe that there are some recommendations that the board members have already agreed uh, with, that primarily being the sign and the gate issues. Um, you know, we can certainly have more dialogue about the, the new proposal to include and cordon off a small section of the park specifically for uh, a particular use. That, that can be an ongoing discussion, and it sounds like from today's uh, work session, we've already gotten prior to even the submission and presentation to the public of these uh, these committee uh, findings. Uh, you heard a lot of people calling in and, and talking about, uh, about that. Um, I suspect that we'll have some more callers, maybe even some of the same callers back on the line when we go back to public comment. And we look forward to hearing from the public um, but at this point, if I could just try to uh, get consensus on a couple of those issues. I'd like to inject one more comment before okay, you go, go ahead. ahead. Peter. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, you know, I want to be clear that um, I don't think uh, opening up a process by having uh, Zoom meetings where members of the public can watch but not be heard is, is adequate public participation. I don't think it shows um, that the public input has been taken into account as the committee made its recommendations. And I think that's a flaw. You, you, made, and, you made that point already, Jeff. And, and <laughs> instead of just harping on that, if, if we could just further put a point on that, uh, that was, I believe, the, the operation of the Springs CAC was only hearing from members and the rest was a listening session. As I believe the councilwoman said, there were something like 95 attendees. Not everybody's gonna be heard in that format, in that venue. And again, those, no decisions were made. It was the beginning of a process and 
frankly, quite the appropriate way to address any issues within the hamlet is to go immediately to the CAC, which the councilwoman did. Well, I've been on CACs where where members of the public. Please, if I if I might just finish. Okay, you 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 tend to go on a little bit longer than I do, Peter. Did we freeze here? No. We're just listening to you, Jeff. Oh, okay. I. Uh, yeah, let's just listen to you. I, I was just going to say that, you know, I've participated in, in uh, the CACs where there are controversial issues and, you know, there are tons of people on the call and they do manage to take comment from the public. And the Wayne Scott CAC, as you know, which we've called the gold standard, um, does that routinely and they control it. They don't they don't just open it up. They first listen to the committee. I'm just saying we didn't do a lot of listening to the public here. We're, we're, Jeff, this is the first opportunity we've had to hear from the public. And we've been listening. I think we had how many callers already today? We've, we've had uh, 11 callers already. And there are a number on, on the call waiting to speak again. And I'd prefer actually to hear from them instead of uh, from uh, from the uh, board members, unless somebody else has a quick comment, Kathy. I, oh, I just want to clarify, and and I appreciate uh, Peter, you you saying that. So that was the January spring PAC meeting where we had not over ninety callers, and it's at that meeting that I said that we were putting together this committee. I asked folks who wanted to volunteer. People volunteered in the chat group. People sent me emails volunteering. I brought it up at the work session when I did my uh, liaison report on the CAC meeting. Again, I opened it up and let ask people if they were interested to reach out, which they did. We also had folks on our monthly meetings for the three months that we met. I had folks who weren't on the committee attend the meetings. So it was it was the process that we follow, you know, under COVID guidelines, because we have to do everything via Zoom, because at the time we weren't meeting in person. But uh, people had their voices heard that wanted to serve on the committee. And now, as you've said, we've brought this to the to the town board, which is in a sense, bringing it to the community and asking for input. And I, you know, appreciate though, you know, that if we could move, you know, on approving the signs, because I think that that will go a long way. Um, right now. Any other board members who haven't spoken? Can I just ask one question? I, I am concerned about invasive species. Um, certainly the planning board does not, uh, when they look at any of their um, landscape plans, allow invasive species to come into the community. We really are trying to get rid of them. Uh, the word invasive is uh, exactly what we don't want. Um, they, the, some of them are pretty. I, uh, I, I know that the Russian olives can get very big and they spread very quickly. So I would doubt that the Russian olives that are at the park were there in, originally from the nursery. They've just been spreading. So, you know, I'm, I would like probably more information about removing um, and what it would what that means about removing those invasive species and putting the grasslands back. The invasive species um, can, you know, make it hard for other um, um, communities to take a hold um, when they're there. So, and I am concerned about the deer that got in and that I wouldn't want that to happen on, you know, I, I know it's happened twice. It was pretty close together. I don't know if it's happened in the past, but um, I am concerned about, you know, what's going on and, and trapping animals. I, I think that, that that feels like what it was, trapped animal in a slow death. So I, that, that bothers me. And I wanna make sure that that doesn't happen again. And again, probably need some more information from Scott about how to manage that park. Since we have a management plan in place and it has, you know, is something that we need to look at, and um, so I just would like to move, uh, you know, maybe not at this moment, uh, you know, but to talk to Scott more about those invasive species and, and putting in that grassland that's there. We know that those grasslands support um, native species here, like the bluebirds, I think it was mentioned earlier, um, and, and, and other 
animals and other plant species. So I, I think it's important for us. To, um, I, I would like to get back to our colonial times, I think is, is what Jeff said, and at least have uh, these, you know, it was beautiful and I wanna retain that beauty. And I think that the, the meadows are beautiful spaces. Um, it's just not what people are used to. And I think invasive species are, um, you know, they, they proliferate and we will continue to have them if we don't consider how to get rid of them. So that's my only comments. At this point, we're an hour and 15 minutes into the meeting and we do have our coastal consultant on the line waiting for our next uh, agenda topic. I, I would like to move on at this point and uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities to discuss some of the other recommendations uh, further in the near future. Uh, we have, um, again, thank you, Neil, for joining us today and presenting the committee's recommendations. And uh, Kathy and Scott for your work on uh, addressing these issues. We, we have our next topic is the Fire Island Montauk Point, um, and that's a partnership agreement. And John Jelnicki, our town attorney, is here to walk us through that. And I believe we also have Aaron Tachunian. Here comes Aaron. Aaron, excuse me. Aaron Pachinian is joining us as well. Getting really nice to meet you. John? Okay. Um, I think everybody's been given a copy of this last agreement from um, the Army Corps regarding the, uh, actually from um, DEC as well. Um, there, um, well, let me see, I got a little summary, so I don't have to read through the whole document with you. But basically, um, you know, we've had some revisions, uh, minor revisions to the proposed agreement um, that were agreed upon. Um, we limited our, our responsibilities only to the portions of the project that lie within the boundaries of the town, which of course makes sense. Um, Don, can, can I just, can you just yeah. give a page number uh, on the stuff that you're, on your comments, is that possible? Uh, well, let me see if I can pull them both up together. If I can do that, I, I haven't noted them in my notes at all. All right, I don't want to. I don't want to make it more difficult um, for you. Then. Let me see if I can pull that up at the same time. And uh, oh, Aram is here. He might actually. <laughs> all right, Aram, feel free Welcome, to jump Aram. in at any point um, with regard to to this agreement. But um, just I mean, basically, it provides that um, we're going to obtain the necessary rights to. Um, go on to property to, to do the work. We are lacking about um, 10 easements, um, all pretty much in the Surfside Drive area um, in order to um, complete this project. And so we'll need to obtain those, those additional easements. Um, there are provisions in the event that we were to incur costs to obtain those easements. Um, we can, um, be reimbursed. There's a process by which we would have to appraise the value of the easements. We'd have to get the appraisals approved by the um, Army Corps. Um, and once that happens, if we needed to go forward with the condemnation of an easement, we could do that. Um, we're hoping that the property owners will see the benefit of this project and voluntarily provide the easements. I mean, it seems to be in their, in their benefit um, as well as in the town's best benefit. Uh, best interest to get those um this um yeah so re with way. regard to those easements john i know with the emergency stabilization project there was 3200 feet of yeah. area and so we got those almost all. almost all of that was privately owned there was a portion to the west that the town owned and as you said this is um all in the surf side stop and would allow for the placement of sand only this is a sand only project uh, in front of those properties. So I can't imagine that any of those property owners would object to having, uh, you know, sand placed uh, and widening the beach uh, for not just uh, the public's enjoyment, but their, theirs as well. Um, right. So that's an integral part. Why don't you uh, just talk briefly about the, the process? It's basically a pass through from the federal government to the state, the state to the town. Is that yes, correct? That, that that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. The, the cost that the town is going to incur is going to be for maintenance and repair and um, rehabilitation of the project in the event there's some storm damage or um, the periodic inspection indicates that some uh, repairs are needed. 
Um, they've estimated the cost of that somewhere around the seven hundred thousand dollar range. Um, uh, John, just to uh, let me clarify that that's for the entire FIMP project. The East Hampton right, cost is right. is only right. about I think forty or fifty thousand, and it's not to bring in new material. It's merely to regrade uh, erosional right. scarps and things I like that, and to provide an annual report. Yeah, I think, I, I think I, it was forty five thousand. I think you're right. And yeah, we we, uh, we just uh, we have to do uh, periodic profiling too, just to show what the profiles are, um, and submit. Uh, we basically have to do an annual report. Um, so this is something that we already do under the emergency stabilization O and M, mm -hmm. and essentially what's being proposed here is to extend uh, an additional. Uh, I think it's twenty eight hundred feet to six thousand lineal feet. We're going to add sand to both ends of the project as Aram uh, convinced the core that widening the project uh, would better um, support, was better supported of um, keeping that beach in place for, you know, that longer period of time. This is on a four-year uh, replenishment cycle once uh, completed. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, there was also, we had some discussion about the possibility of whether you might want to add in some additional, uh, they, they referred to them as betterments uh, under this agreement to include some uh, work at ditch planes. And um, Aram has provided us with a, um, a sample a memorandum of understanding that's been used in, in other areas um, for doing that. We would do that after this agreement is in place. And that allows us to, you know, negotiate out the terms of, of that betterment with the Army Corps separate from the FEMP. Um, so we can do that after we are in uh, in contract. So, so with regard to that, um, and Aaron, maybe you can put a little finer point on it. It doesn't uh, commit the town to the betterment uh, initially. It just puts us in the queue for that, and then that would be negotiated at a at a later time. Right. Yeah, that's correct. And it also gives the town the, the time necessary to really figure out what is uh, the most appropriate betterment for, for ditch planes and to get a handle on what the potential costs would be. Right. And I think that's something that will be necessary. Uh, this past year, ditch suffered pretty, pretty heavily. Uh, and right now, the conditions there are, are pretty bleak. Uh, it's down to a hard pan and much of the boulders and, and uh, even some concrete from the old uh, structures that used to be on that shoreline. Old parts of foundation and whatnot are, are exposed. It hasn't looked like this since uh, after Sandy. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll get some help from Mother Nature with southwest winds, but this is an area we probably should consider um, a betterment for as part of this process. And then we're, we'll be required to um, participate in the, in the federal floodplain management and flood insurance programs, which we do already. I mean, we have the, the um, program in effect here. And um, we are also representing that we'll um, provide uh, education and, and uh, of zoning and regulatory agencies so that they adopt um, and we adopt regulations that are um, protective of the um, of the beach and the dunes and, and doesn't um, unnecessarily um, impact those areas. And I think, you know, it's kind of like the nutshell. Fortunately, the kind of East Hampton has what's required in the, in the FIMP program. Aaron, we're having a little trouble with your audio. Could you state that again? Yeah, let me, I'm going to turn my video off. I, I just have a bad signal. Um, wh what I was saying was, fortunately, the town of East Hampton has a very robust floodplain management, dune protection, zoning code, and, that, uh, and the resiliency programs that you have in place all far exceed what's required in FIM. Any questions for uh, Aram or John? No, currently, uh, you know, I read through the 51 page document when Kathy and I met with uh, Steve Couch and representatives from the Army Corps of Engineers and the DEC. I know, Peter, you've been talking with them a lot. Also, Aaron was there also. They uh, there's a lot of discussion about 
uh, about the PPA and also about the betterments to move forward then too. And I, I feel very comfortable moving forward in this direction. I'm very happy we're moving forward and I want to continue get this done ASAP so we can continue the press to get our place back earlier in the queue as we were initially promised. I also discussed this with the Mom Talk CAC last night so they are aware that this is on for discussion today and we want to sign this uh, without haste. What is the timing on this? It's like yesterday, right? That the that the Army Corps is looking for town to sign off. Aram, you want to address that? I know I know they've been very anxious to actually get that uh, all those PPAs signed. Um, they were hoping to have that happen by the end of May, but we had ling some lingering questions, and I know some of the other municipalities involved have had some questions to get uh, clarified. So. Um, can you speak to that, Aram? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, the uh, we we do need to get this done yesterday. Uh, it's my understanding that Babylon has already signed on. Um, I, I've been in close conversation with Southampton. Uh, they are on the precipice of signing. They had some legal language they needed to get clarification on from the DEC General Counsel. I believe that was done uh, today or yesterday. Um, and so uh, I'm hopeful that that uh, Southampton will be signing this week as well. And uh, that uh, leaves the county, which my understanding is that the county executive is fully on board, but he wants to make sure his participating towns are with him. And then uh, Brookhaven and Islip, I know Brookhaven had some additional questions. They've been meeting repeatedly with the DEC and the Army Corps. And um, I don't know if their signature is imminent, but I know that uh, Supervisor Romain uh, wants to get to yes on this. He just wants to be sure that he understands the full scope of the project. And just for background, Brookhaven's a little bit different than in Montauk because they have a lot of home elevations on the mainland that, that we don't have in, in downtown Montauk. So their, their aspect of the project has more moving parts. Right. So Thanks. John, Thank you. So, John, are you comfortable with the language in the that's put forth here yeah i think um you know there were there was some question about the language re relating to condemnation and i had discussed it with condemnation council and and he was comfortable with uh with moving forward um on this i i understand southampton has a much uh, larger number of easements than, than we have to than, than what we need to obtain um many times over so i understand their concern for it but in talking to condemnation council um, the one area where I did have some concern, I'm comfortable with now after having a discussion with them about it. So, um, so are yeah. you looking to have then a re resolution drafted for the meeting on the 15th? We actually did a resolution already to uh, approve the signature of it. We were just waiting for the re revised document when we did the resolution and it came in afterwards. So, um, but we just wanted to review it with the board, make sure everybody was comfortable with it before we move forward. I apologize. Any other questions, concerns, comments from board members? I would just add that uh, while we are, are supportive of this project, that we also know that this is just an intermediate step towards achieving our overall goals for downtown Montauk. Mm -hmm. This, uh, you know, maintaining a, a wide beach there uh, for as long as we can is obviously incredibly important to the downtown area and to the town as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm not sure really that we believe that this is a sustainable situation over the coming future, um, but uh, this hopefully will give us enough time to do our longer range, complete our longer range plans, zoning and incentives to uh, really rebuild and ensure a, a vibrant and viable downtown for generations. Um, in the face of ever increasing storms at sea level rise. At this point, I'd like to move on to the next agenda item, which is weight uh, limitations that are proposed for Akabonic Road and Councilman Lees. You are presenting that. We've already heard from a few callers during public comment in support of that effort. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Um, this is a discussion that we've had a long time ago, you know, a couple of years ago, when we started initializing, um, first of all, through the Hamlet studies. 
I think it was discussed in the, the East Hampton CAC. Sylvia, I didn't know you were the liaison back then when it was initially discussed, even the CAC liaison in East Hampton, Montauk, and now Wayne Scott in a couple of years. So, and uh, Amagansett. And Amagansett, yes, very good. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so it was discussed as long range forecast when the LIRR was going to be increasing the height of their trestles. That then hence would allow uh, the over 100 year old impediment to tall, tra uh, tall trucks running through Akabonic or down uh, North Main Street. It will allow for a greater height and for greater tr potential truck traffic. So that, was, that had been seen, it was coming. Uh, this was talked about in the Hamlet study specifically from, uh, and then also through the East Hampton CA, uh, CAC. Uh, just quickly, it's just the. I am just going to. Let me see here. I'm just going to quickly just share these uh, these three things here. Um, we're looking. What we're looking to do is just change the East Hampton Town Code Section 240-60 Schedule 10. Uh, this is where it's for commercial vehicles over a certain weight, length, and or passenger capacity is ex excluded. Uh, there is currently no weight limits on any within this section of the code for any town roads. There are ones in the village. The only time that this section is used in the town code is for actually passenger limits of, of travelers at Indian Wells Beach for dropping off a certain amount of passengers and buses. Uh, what the recommendation that I want to move forward on, it also comes from a letter that we uh, it's been supported by residents, particularly a letter that we got dated 525. So pretty much trying to act on this within not even two weeks from Charles Killer and also from Barbara Strong. And it was signed by, I believe, close to 90, sorry, I have it here, 78 of the nearby residents. Uh, the recommendation that I would like to push to the town board to see their interest in the following uh, suit would be for a nine time weight limit. This would be on Akabonic Road from Collins Ave intersection to the Floyd Street intersection. And this would be except for local deliveries. The area that it would engulf would be the one in the red here with the, with the triangle. Um, it would go from Collins Ave and the, and the southern tier of Akabonic Road up to Floyd Street. Uh, again, this has been recommended uh, by, in 2017 by the CAC. Uh, uh, it is also uh, in recommendation uh, from Steve Lynch and the discussions with him also. Uh, and another thing, not just for the continue the character of this neighborhood, uh, you know, need down there, public safety, uh, take some of the volume of the traffic down there, but also this whole area was just freshly paved within the last year, just by chance. And what taking off certain weight limits on there would also increase the, uh, the probable period of usefulness for the Akabonic Road subsurface. So there could be a great savings on that also. So this is what I'd like the town board just to discuss today and bring up as far as recommendations. I wouldn't mind hearing from any of the town board members about this. Um, I'll leave it up to the board. Um, I'll, I'll start by just saying, you know, I have had uh, noise complaints from folks on Akabonic uh, just from the amount of traffic, car traffic and, and trucks already making noises on there. And this was not just um, within, you know, within the raising of the, of the trestle. So it's a residential area. It's really charming. And I would, you know, agree that we need to limit the truck um, size here. And I would also look into, I don't know what the, uh, is it 30 miles an hour, David? I'll have to double check, but uh, I believe it is. It is. Okay. All right. Uh, and we need to have somebody there to make sure that we stay at 30 miles an hour. And just, just to add to my initial point, when we were looking at the stop sign, this is another phase that we were going to be looking at initially and you know, in doing. So we're finally getting to that. And hopefully the, if we do this, you know, some of that quality of life uh, will be retained in, in the residential area down there. Knowing that the stop sign, everyone's getting used to it now. Uh, this is the, one of those next steps. Potentially, we could phase in a decrease in um, uh, in, the, in the speed limit levels down there. But again, I'd like to hear from the board members and how they feel. Yep. I support it. I, you know, I think anything we can do to keep the town quiet, rural is better. Um, and Steve Lynch is on, on board with this, uh, David? He says, now that the railroad bridges have been raised, there is no reason for heavy truck traffic from Collins Ave to Floyd Street and Akabonic Road because they can come down 27 under the bridge and down Collins or vice versa. Great. 
Great. Yeah, I think it's a, a very, I think it's an important move. We got neighbors uh, appropriately, you know, concerned, sa- safety, noise, quality of life. I, I support it. I, I, I have to agree with Sylvia and Jeff. I, this is actually how I get home to Springs every night. It's acabonic. I, I've seen the changes. And, uh, you know, and I appreciate all the effort the neighbors did to, you know, engage everyone in that area. And uh, I, you know, I, I support moving forward with the weight limit. Um, I do have to say, so I was at a softball game last night and I saw the Cangelosis there. How, that's, uh, that's a softball <laughs> They're right there. <laughs> softball family in town, of course, they were there. Uh, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cangelosi and their, their family are supportive of this also, even though they couldn't okay. get call into it. And that's, again, a large uh, <laughs> section of the, of the <laughs> population down there. Um, but with that, what I wouldn't mind doing now is to hear from, hear from the rest of the public also. We've heard some, from some of the residents there. If I can draft the language and get it out to a public hearing, uh, we can hear from the rest of the, you know, the rest of the community on, on this. And that's where I would like to take it. Uh, Peter, if you're okay with that, I'd like to. Yeah, I, I agree with the rest of the board on this. Um, you know, when I was the liaison to East Hampton, uh, Sag Harbor, CAC, this was discussed in advance of the trestle raising. And, uh, you know, there, I think everybody decided that we were concerned about those potential impacts, but until the trestles were actually raised, it would be impossible to know for certain what kind of changes would happen. And uh, I believe we're, we're well aware that the changes that we were concerned about have actually taken place and we should be addressing it in this way. So I, I would be supportive of scheduling that public hearing and let's hear from the public. So I know that Carla Ash also asked for it to be extended to um, town uh, line road, town lane, sorry. Is that something that is being considered or did did you ask Steve Lynch about that proposal? I have not. That's the first time I've heard okay. heard for that request. Uh, I, I think what I would like to try to do right now is we can maybe keep phasing this through. Potentially okay. she might get some relief from this action and okay. then we can continue to see exactly how, you know, we can maybe phase and, and work with you know, work within the zoning code to give them relief also then too. Okay. I but no, I, have, I haven't asked them this again. It's the first time I've heard that comment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, board members. Thank you very much. And moving on. Next on the agenda is a COVID response and vaccination update. In uh, March of 2020, I convened meetings with public safety officials to coordinate the response to COVID-19 and declared a state of emergency uh, that initiated the incident command structure for response, and that occurred way back on March 13th of 2020. Uh, the 16th, the town offices were closed at that month, and we began participating in daily calls with the um, county executive and with the county health commissioner, as well as um, you know a number of other state officials and the governor's office directly. In addressing the crisis, um, we reached out to local health care providers and food store operators. Council Bragman's office was helpful in collecting food retailer and hospitality contact lists. And uh, later on, you know, we started uh, presenting and maintaining all the uh, various code regulations regarding COVID safety and uh, to the public. We began with enhanced protocols for cleaning of all of town locations. And in May, we were fortunate to uh, have Dr. Bruce Polsky become a pro bono epidemiologist consultant for the town. David Lease made that connection. Mr. Polsky, Dr. Polsky is a local resident and was willing to give of himself uh, his time to help ensure that his community stayed safe. We enhanced our public info and outreach through education to keep public safety and confidence. Here you can see a screenshot of our town website, which has been improved uh, over the duration of our of our time here. The website, social media usage within the town 
has expanded due to the ability of um, presented us by hiring outside PR firm, Erlen Rosen, uh, back in July at the recommendation of the, um, co the Business Recovery Committee. That, uh, that committee was formed to help us understand what the impacts of COVID would be to a business and the general public. Just in uh, website hits alone, since January of this year, we've had more than 285,000 visits, 411,000 uh, page views, and over 260 downloads. So, um, you know, the town website's been improved. You can see here in this photograph, the vaccine info button, there's updates for vaccination and pre-registry information, as well as coronavirus information, as well as other things that are going on in town. There was a, um, sorry, the uh, COVID restrictions eased, uh, town providing assistance to restaurants. And then you can also see some of the other business we conduct. There's the skate park survey up on the side of the page. The social um, media outlook, uh, improved considerably as our platforms are expanded. Facebook, uh, in the last 28 days, we've had a 121% increase. The post engagement went up 250%. And uh, there was an 83% increase in uh, tweet impressions or views. That's an 8,669 monthly average since January. And to date on Instagram, our followers went from single digits to over 4,400 as of today. Part of that outreach was to make the public aware of how to stay safe in a rapidly evolving crisis. Um, you know, it's, it's really clear uh, looking back in hindsight that, you know, many of the concerns and worries that we had uh, really didn't come to bear. And as we gained better scientific information about how this disease spread, we were able to combat it effectively. And being able to, um, you know, address that uh, concern was aided by our public media presence. Here you can see uh, a post that shows how transmission occurs and what the likelihood it is and why you need to wear masks. So the Business Recovery Committee was, was formed in May and uh, Sylvia Overby chaired it. The weekly meetings are ongoing to date. And as I said earlier, the committee urged the town to amplify public messaging for community safety and the economy. We uh, enabled outdoor dining through the expansion and emergency order. One of the hardest hit economic factors within our town is restaurants. Uh, it also affected gyms and other activities, which through executive order, we were able to accommodate uh, outdoors. The economy, you know, is protected by having a good understanding of how businesses operate and what their needs are. And as I said, under, you know, the emergency situation, we were able to assist businesses. We had a beach reopening committee and uh, this is something that we know is uh, crucially important to our local economy. Being able to open our beaches under COVID was, uh, was challenging at best. We needed to ensure that um, people could continue to go to the beach and comply with the regulations. In April of 2020, I was appointed, appointed to the countywide task force and safe beach reopening protocols. And we uh, developed a plan that in East Hampton that actually became the template for many communities on Long Island. Councilman Lee spearheaded much of the local beach committee uh, recommendations and worked with buildings and grounds to ensure that our restrooms and other facilities were cleaned at heightened protocols throughout the pandemic. Beach capacity is, con is still restricted to 50% as of May of this year. Uh, we do hope that this season those restrictions will be lifted as we continue to see improvement in the, um, the numbers. Human services response was quite robust. I, I felt it was important to close the town senior center early to protect our most vulnerable 
citizens. Here you can see on the left, this is uh, Human Services with Kathy Burke Gonzalez, the liaison along with staff, and one of the one of the uh, town's uh, participants in the senior program receiving an over 90 uh, birthday proclamation that arose. And on the right, you can see it's not actually an episode of The Bachelor, but um, <laughs> visiting, visiting one of our, our local residents. The town to date has prepared over and delivered over 83,000 meals during the COVID period. Uh, it's really a remarkable achievement to ensure that seniors who are shut-ins uh, have access to the, what they need. In March of 2020, a telephone check-in program was instituted for our seniors, and um, Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez tracked community and food pantry needs. Raising funds for local food pantries, Councilwoman and I both participated in a special drive-in movie night, which ensured that hundreds of thousands of dollars were contributed to our local food pantries. We worked with AFTI all for the East End as well to raise funds. It was a great evening to participate in and resulted in uh, ongoing supplies for those in most need. COVID testing to protect the community. We we knew that there would be problems with access to testing as initially only Stony Brook Hospital had testing available and to have testing right here in East Hampton was extremely important. We worked with the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation and Hudson River Healthcare to bring the very first testing back in the spring of 2020, right here to East Hampton at the Panago Place ball fields. And uh, then partnered later on with Stony Brook Hospital uh, foundation for Montauk and both East Hampton High School to ensure that our local residents had access to testing. Then we arranged with Test Before You Go company to have COVID testing right here at the Town Hall campus back in January of 2020. And uh, that's currently still operating here if anybody needs a, a COVID test. And we also have COVID testing that's available in Montauk at the town owned parking lot by the uh, state program for Port Pond. Vaccine, when it became available, uh, was understood to be the best way out of this pandemic. And so we worked very hard. I know uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to imagine that uh, we wouldn't just get vaccine here uh, from state and county officials, uh, but the demand was so high and the supply so low that uh, it was very difficult to find a vaccine anywhere. I knew that if we built a vaccination center, that we would have an opportunity to get a distribution of vaccine here for local residents. We formulated a committee to plan for the conversion of the CDCH building into a mass vaccination center. Councilman David Lease was instrumental with buildings and grounds, getting that property ready. None of the ceiling tiles were in that building and had gone through a mold remediation program and not yet been renovated. We turned that around very quickly. Then we got our first delivery of vaccine and vaccine was so scarce and valuable that police escorts were necessary to deliver it. We kept it in our pharmacy grade refrigerator freezers we reached out to local volunteers to ensure that we had a smooth and efficient process for distributing vaccine to the public. And here you can see morning assignments to volunteers um, preparing for the vaccination pod. East Hampton's really weathered this storm and safeguarded residents from uh, the ravages of the pandemic We've had the, one of the lowest rates of infection anywhere on Long Island, second only to Shelter Island. And as of June 6th, the Long Island COVID positivity rate, seven day average is less than half of 1%. Statewide positivity rate is just over half of 1%. And as of now, uh, the governor has announced that 
The remaining COVID restrictions will be lifted when 70% of New Yorkers have first vaccine dose. East Hampton is, is well on our way. We're actually ahead of much of Long Island. Three of our zip codes in town um, have the highest vaccination rates on Long Island. 83% have had at least the first dose in Amagansett, Montauk, and East Hampton zip codes, which obviously includes spring as well. None of this would be possible without the cooperation of my fellow board members and from the multitude of volunteers and citizens that came forward to volunteer and help us through what's been a really difficult and challenging time in our history. I'm extremely grateful for all the support that we've received and look forward to having this pandemic fully behind us. If you haven't been vaccinated yet, please get vaccinated. You can go to our town website, find the nearest location to get vaccinated. Very easy, no waits. And uh, we can get back to normal and get that 70% benchmark met and receive, uh, uh, you know, I think all the benefits of continuing with uh, life in a more normal way. So again, I want to thank all my fellow board members for making all this possible. Well, one thing, Peter, it's it's sort of interesting, like you forget things that you did such a long time ago because so many things have changed, you know? I mean, the, the first testing site that was there, I mean, I've sort of already forgotten about it, but, uh, you know, it's kudos to yourself for, for moving this forward. I mean, it was Friday the 13th. You know, I remember uh, being with you when uh, we were pacing to see what was going to go on, but Friday the 13th, 2 p.m. is when we declared the state of emergency for the town of East Hampton. And I think the federal state of emergency was declared even just later that day. Uh, I do want to say that one, one of the industries that you also helped protect was the, uh, the commercial fishing industry out here. They were shut down and not declared as essential uh, businesses and, uh, and even the charter fishing industry. So, you know, you, you kept pushing to the state and through the county ranks on those county calls to allow them to open up and even more so to have the shoreside infrastructure available if they needed to go get their hydraulic hoses from, you know, uh, you know so from the marine basin or such. So that, those are small things that I remember working through with FAC and others and also trying to look for, you know, business grants that were coming in for small businesses, including the fishery. So uh, let's not forget about that one too, but well done, Peter. Thank you. I mean, it, it's true that uh, you kind of forget about some of the things uh, that occurred and, and what happened. And, you know, one of the other things that, that we did is we lobbied very heavily and strongly for our catering uh, businesses to make sure that there was equality and equity in the way regulations were um, being promulgated. And, uh, you know, we were successful in having those restrictions really reflect the best science and uh, ensure that our, our local, you know, community members could get back to work. So um, again, you know, that's possible without all of your, with all of your help. Yeah, Peter, th thank you. Um, I, well, I think thank you because we had to just relive this, but um, <laughs> so I, I remember at the very beginning too, when we were trying to, you know, work with our businesses uh, with their stimulus checks, making sure that they um, were able to, to contact their banks and understand what the steps were for um, getting a, a stimulus check for their employees and, and keeping those businesses alive. And keeping them open, you know, they had to do a lot of work too. But I mean, we were instrumental, I think, in helping them find the the right links. Um, you know, communication at that point was so important because nobody was going anywhere. <laughs> we were so we we had to make sure that, that that we were able to get the information out. And and I really appreciate that. And and I had forgotten about that portion of it of getting um, putting all that stuff together for them you know, making sure they had it. Right, I mean, we had over 500 posts alone just for yeah. advisements on, uh, you know, CARES Act and any number of other ways that businesses could be assisted, individuals, rent control, the, the uh, prohibition on evictions, uh, you name it. It's just been a constant whirlwind for more than a year, um, all in every day, and I, again, uh, without the support of my staff directly, Joanne Pilgrim, yeah. my you know chief of staff and executive assistant, Ann Bell, and all of you, um, you know I don't I don't know that we would have done we would have fared quite so well. So 
Um, and and, and I, I think we have to give also just, you know, uh, respect out to also our enforcement agencies and our emergency medical technicians and working together with them because there was so much uncertainty initially then too. And a lot of those face-to-face -face calls came to them. They still had to respond and how do we respond? What are we responding to? So your coordination with those agencies also was extremely important too. And then, then, then also their leadership was important. Uh, there, it took a lot of leadership, Peter. Well, you know, again, on the front line, you have, uh, you know, your first responders who at the time, they didn't know what they were walking into. Nobody was really even certain about how this did it. And uh, yet they answered the call. All of our town department heads and town staff who hung in there and we kept the wheels of government turning, uh, albeit maybe in a couple areas a little bit slower than normal, but we managed to get you know, the tax um, assessment goals done in compliance with the requirement of law. Uh, we managed to keep the basic functions of government going, sanitation department and everything else. And it's odd thinking back now to when all the shelves were bare in the grocery store and uh, you know that, that persisted for some time nobody could find toilet paper uh cleaning supplies hand, hand sanitizer i mean pretty remark remarkable and, and surreal even trying to think back across what we were all facing and uh you know we're in a much better place obviously now uh, but to have uh, have that uh, support from our local community, I think, you know, that is one of the biggest blessings of living here is the small town community that we live in. People were willing to step up and help out. I fielded dozens and dozens of calls, people asking, how can I help? You know, I live in this community too. And, you know, whether it was volunteering their time in food pantries or making major donations to food pantries, uh, whatever it was, everybody was coming together to get us to do so. Um, just grateful to be here, proud to serve, and uh, I guess that's all I have to say on that. If I could say, Peter, uh, yeah, I have to tell you, I got emotional watching your PowerPoint <laughs> because it really did take me back to, you know, March, you know, because when the economy shut down, our local food bank pantries and food banks, you know, were in a perfect storm. Demand was rising at an extraordinary level. I think we had a 300% increase in folks going to the food pantries and it flooded a charitable system that was never designed to handle uh, like a nationwide crisis. So on top of, you know, the local food pantries with this, you know, they had massive supply chain issues, food shortages, escalating food costs, and volunteers were saying they'd never witnessed such a combination of need and scarcity and anxiety. And um, it's just amazing how they've stepped up. And I know, you know, reflect back, you know, we would make pitches during our liaison reports for folks to consider contributing to their local food pantries. And you know what, I, I probably, shame on me, I should be, I should continue to say that because people are still struggling and our food supply pantries could um, still need the support. And then to, you know, what we've given a lot more attention to is the good works in human services and how they came together as a team. But like, I remember in the beginning where we were trying to do like red team, blue team, because we wanted to divide, divide our staffs in half because God forbid somebody in, you know, team, blue team, you know, contact, contracted COVID, we didn't want the whole department to go down. And, but we soon learned that, you know, if you're vigilant with your mask wearing, you know, we, we could protect each other and, you know, and washing hands and whatnot. But to think I see you've, you've added the updated numbers that since COVID started, the fact that we've delivered over 80,000 meals, you know, it, when we normally do 18,000 in a year. I mean, it's just, and the tens of thousands of phone calls that have been made and for wellness checks. And, you know, I forgot about the drive-in movie where I had to make a video that had to be on the large screen. And then one of the, the brightest days, I guess, as a council person was the over 90 uh, event when we went to seniors homes who, you know, um, hadn't, you know, been in touch with each other and, you know, we guys, we went in September, so it had been well over six months 
And uh, it was just, it's, it's, it's extraordinary what we've done as a, as a community. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to throw a word in if I can, uh, just to uh, add sure, a word, uh, on behalf of East, East End Cares, who, you know, was one of the, which was one of the uh, organizations that really pitched in and assisted the town and have a great, uh, great uh, group of dedicated employees that uh, volunteers who, who really came out as well. And uh, it was a really nice, uh, very important organization in, in a time of uh, pandemic, and they did a great job as well. Absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's funny, you know, thinking back, there were so many different things that happened uh, over that time. And uh, I have to say, it's, you know, one of the most challenging things personally I've faced in my life especially being in this position. Uh, and yet at the same time, it's been one of the very most rewarding things that I've ever been involved with. Um, there's just no comparison to seeing the faces of those seniors uh, who've been you know, isolated from their community for so long, um, getting a visit, albeit outside in kind of distance, but uh, you can just see the joy and uh, that was shared by us as well. Uh, seeing the the burden and of fear and anxiety lifted off people's faces as they became vaccinated, um, unbelievable. Uh, those responses, just sheer joy, tears of joy in some cases, uh, the ability for people to go visit loved ones who they hadn't seen in some time. Uh, you know, I know there's so many of us who, you know, have been separated from our families and. Uh, it's been really difficult, especially if you have aging parents and, you know, at, at a time where um, you couldn't travel to see them and they couldn't travel to see you. And um, so, you know, I think um, while the, the spread of the disease is diminished significantly and hopefully this is the end of it and we can beat it, uh, we're not really done in terms of uh, recovery. We, are, we face, I think, a number of issues and crises that, that will be the result of this pandemic, uh, not the least of which was the fact that we had a huge population come as refugees, if you will, from the epicenter of the, of the worldwide pandemic at the time, New York City. Um, we accommodated the extra population well. We managed to keep the rates low. But because it was such a popular place to come and uh, ride this out, our home prices have gone up 30, 35% by some accounts, um, which has its benefits and its detriments. Um, the housing crisis is even more dire than it was before, and it was in crisis mode before the pandemic. We have a lot of work to do to try and ameliorate those impacts. We will, we will be facing, depending on how many people actually decide to stay, uh, a, a more year-round community model instead of a, more of a resort second home kind of a town. And that will bring additional stresses uh, on us um, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of dealing with garbage, in terms of potential impacts on taxes. Um, so we're not, we're not through the, the effects of this disease. Uh, on us, and uh, you know, I think focusing on the future and how to move forward to to regain our our foothold and our standing um, to maintain our community standards uh, and protect our environment. These are all ongoing challenges. I, I know you're all up to the task, and uh, again, appreciate your support to get us to this point. At this point, I think we could move on to liaison reports. Sure. Kathy? Okay, so Springs Fireplace Road, construction continues. They're doing work right now at the intersections of, at Abraham's Path. They're still on target for a July 34th completion date, but the paving schedule hasn't been released yet. Uh, on, I guess I was going to say on Monday, that was yesterday, uh, the planning department and I met with our consultants for the Springs Fireplace Road Corridor Study. They're, they're getting ready. They're making a presentation, as you recall, 
uh, at next Tuesday's uh, work session on June 15th. They're going to be giving us an update. Peter Flinker will be talking about the planning side of things, Lisa LaCorey, an environmental update, and Ray DeBias will be discussing traffic and proposals for some of the key intersections in that corridor. One of the things I asked is as a next step, if we could um, follow up the work sessions in July and have uh, two meetings, one with business owners and property owners and the other with interested in community members, we could do it via Zoom, Zoom, you know, just to get more engagement, uh, you know, because that's such a, you know, a busy area. People's livelihoods are invested there for the business owners and property owners. And it's like folks like to say, it's the gateway to Springs. So uh, since, you know, Dotson and Flinker and Lisa LaCorey and whatnot do public engagement so well. Um, we saw that with the Hamlet studies, kind of like want to follow up what we did when we launched the corridor study. And there is room in the budget since we've been doing all of our meetings via Zoom for them to accommodate us. So that's, and we'll send out letters uh, like we did the last time to business owners and property owners and get the word out. Um, I had some outreach for some folks that live up by Hog Creek Road in Springs. As you know, if you go up Three Mile Harbor and right around uh, Lion's Head, the road curves and goes all the way over to Springs Fireplace Road. That speed limit uh, going uh, east to west from Three Mile Harbor to Springs Fireplace Road is 35 miles an hour. And we, uh, you know, it's a residential area. So folks up there would like to see it reduced to 30 miles an hour. I brought it to the spring CAC. And what I'd like to do now is work with uh, the town attorney's office to just draft legislation so we can take that uh, to public hearing. Uh, spring CAC met at the end of last month. Um, We've had over the last two meetings, we've done a lot of discussion about litter. You know, it just seems that uh, we've seen more litter than we have before. We've got some folks that are volunteering along the corridor in Springs for cleanup and they, you know, they want to help and try to figure out how we can solve this. And um, so I had talked to Sylvia a couple of times and she's got a uh, litter subcommittee of the Energy Sustainability Committee and they've done a lot of work over the last few years. Uh, so what we're gonna do is Sylvia and I are gonna meet with the spring CAC's litter subcommittee so Sylvia can get us up to speed and you know we can all work collaboratively together to try to get our arms around it. Or they become, can become a member if they would like yeah, to. I, I also <laughs> volunteer that, um, so. Uh, okay, good. We're gonna set that meeting up for this month. And then uh, Friday, the planning department, town attorney's office, uh, and myself, we met with the wireless consultants from Cityscape because they're on also on the agenda for next Tuesday, the 15th. As I had mentioned last month, they're going to kind of be giving us a wireless 101 overview. They're going to, they've been out here a couple of times. They've got uh, inventory maps. They're going to show us coverage maps and where the gaps are. And uh, as we had talked about, they had proposed doing a poll, a townwide poll to help inform the legislation and that they'll be drafting that needs, desperately needs an update as well as the uh, wireless master plan. And so that's uh, my liaison report. And then I was, I know we got emails this morning from, um, from John Jelnicki and I'm sure board members have gotten phone calls from folks who are, you know, have local landscaping businesses that are want to comply with the legislation. They want to use, you know, electric leaf blowers, but that, um, you know, they're impossible to to get. The wait times are are, are weeks, you know, and nobody locally uh, can get their hands on them. So I was wondering if I know that. Um, Code enforcement, because we talk about it at the enforcement meetings on Friday mornings, have been, and PD, uh, have been giving out flyers in English and Spanish to landscaping crews and speaking to companies and, you know, issuing warnings about um, not using, you know, diesel, you know, gas uh, powered, um, you know, blowers 
but that they were going to be getting ready very soon to start issuing um, summonses. And I was wondering if that was, if we want to take into consideration that uh, they haven't been able to source them because they're, they're sold out everywhere. And do we want to just continue right now to give warnings uh, and let's see if the market can catch up and, and so that these crews who want to, you know, follow the law and, uh, you know, give them a little bit more uh, uh, time to, to get the equipment that they need. Is, is there a provision that has a waiver that we can get a, a waiver can be requested also? So would this be, a, you know, a, re, a request of a waiver by the certain individual? Yeah, I think, I think honestly, we need to do a little bit more research. I've, I have heard from uh, several different landscaping companies that they're trying to acquire backpack battery blowers. I don't know that the handhelds are also unavailable. So I think looking into that, you know, most of the blowing at this time of year, because it's not fall, is really just blowing off patios and, and uh, walkways and pool, uh, pool areas uh, of grass clippings. And what in the world do we ever do before gas leaf blowers? I mean, you know, I think there was something called a broom and a rake, but you know, I, I don't see that there's a real heavy amount of work uh, to, to take care of that. But again, you know, I, I think it's worth uh, actually meeting with some of the landscapers. I, I spoke to a prominent landscaper in Montauk about this specific issue. Uh, I think we need to try to understand what their, what their concerns are and their customers' concerns are and, and how we can help facilitate compliance. Um, but, you know, it's not like we hadn't been talking about this for a while. I know there's a, a bit of transition here that's going to be necessary, uh, but I would hope it wouldn't be all summer. So, yeah, let me just, w one question I had is, you know, th this law was enacted in the village over a year ago, if, if not longer. So are those companies did they not get leaf blowers for the village or do we have Carol any information on who's registered in the village uh, for contracting um, versus who's here and, and if we don't can we get that information from the village I probably can get it from them because they use mine first okay uh, because they require our license before you can get their license as a landscaper okay so um I think I could get that. Well, I think South that Hampton, would be Yeah, Southampton Village has also had that regulation for some time yeah. as well. So mm -hmm. it's not completely but, new. You know, like like anything, the transition period is is uh, sometimes painful. And um, so I've, you know, I've also read the emails where some folks can't at this point get um, a leaf blower, an electric leaf blower. I've also heard from residents to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so much quieter in my neighborhood that actually now when they hear a leaf blower, it's almost, you know, they've gotten used to the sound of everybody using it. Now they're so attuned to just one going off that it, it rattles them. Um, I've had a conversation with Kevin Cooper and want to thank him and his uh, group at uh, the um, code enforcement for uh, having the flyer, printing the flyer in both English and Spanish, making sure that they hand it out when they, and giving warnings. Um, you know, that's, that's good community relations as well um, for all of us. And I thank him for doing that. I just had everyone sent a PDF of those flyers. So if you wanna download them, give them out at your CAC meetings or any kind of, of meeting where you can get them, um, either the, you know, you can send the PDF to them and let people download it so um, you know they can have it in both English and Spanish and they can hand it to their own landscaper so that um, you know this is going to take one of those things where everybody has to participate including those that use landscapers not just the landscape folks themselves so there will be a transition period I, I think it's worth talking about if there's some issues but I'd love to get from Carol the list um, so we can compare the two lists between the village and thank you Carol I appreciate it. I'm inclined to agree with uh, Peter that we can check into the availab availability of the equipment. Um, you know, I, I agree that the transition period is a little bumpy as usual, but I think the uh, 
peace and quiet that we've given the town is the is something to keep our eye on because it's getting very favorable re reaction from uh, residents for sure. Um, I, I've actually experienced it. Um, I, had to, I had to ask uh, my uh, the guy that cuts my lawn to not use the blowers because it, it freaks the dogs out. And he came by recently and was, you know, was obviously using an electric blower and it was like nothing. It, did, it was the noise level was so much less. It was really uh, pleasant. Actually, I frankly don't think I need leaf blowers, but it makes a big difference. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, there is a, there is a transition and move by all the major manufacturers to produce this type of equipment. You know, all the all the major brands uh, and it's worth uh, noting that the town has been working to make the transition as well. Here at Town Hall, I saw yesterday, I think, the, yeah, the, yesterday big, the, electric. the big green electric grass cutter. Yep. And it's so much quieter, it cuts really well, and it's quite fast and powerful. <laughs> and uh, it's really remarkable to see. It had yeah. to maybe a third the noise level. I, I mean, you can actually hold a meeting as they're mowing outside my window in these single pane rattly windows. Uh, and I, it wasn't yeah. distracting at all. So, yeah. um, you know, cleaner, quieter. Um, and, I, and I appreciate that this is maybe a big step for some. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to get through, and I just ask for everybody's patience and uh, cooperation. Okay, well, thank you for the liaison report. Who's up next? Um, I'll take a stab at this. Uh, so, uh, BOEM has reopened a comment period for a notice of intent to repair the, the EIS for the Revolution Wind Project. Uh, I will notice this to our FAC already, also the Montauk CAC. Uh, this peer comment period will close on June 11, 2021. Again, the Revolution Wind Project is a project that is uh, not part of the South Fork Wind, Wind Project, but uh, they are opening a comment period. So if anyone has interest in that, please go to boehm.gov backslash revolution hyphen wind hyphen scope and hyphen virtual hyphen meetings. Um, the Montauk CAC met last night. Uh, we met again via Zoom. Uh, we had uh, uh, numerous different discussions, first about the Beach Advisory Committee and some of the recommendations to the town board and how we can continue moving forward with some of the recommendations. One of the ones specifically that was stifling them was they recommended to the town board, and I know I mentioned this, uh, I, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, they would like to see the parking fees reduced at Kirk Park, reduced to $35 from $50. Uh, they gave anecdotal stories in which individuals are now parking in other areas of the village and not parking there, or they're witnessing individuals that want to park in Kirk Park, but turn around when they see it's 50, and they go to a different area of town. Uh, I am in favor of reducing it back to $35. I, uh, we saw that there was, for Saturday and Sunday, uh, there was about just under $900 collected for each day there. Uh, I think that would be higher. Um, I went out there on Sunday. Um, I was in Montauk Saturday and Sunday, maybe or maybe just Sunday for my daughter's cancer recital, and the parking lot was about a third full. So um, I want to talk to the town board to see if that is something that they would be interested in potentially reducing uh, back to thirty-five dollars. Yeah, I mean, David, my my own personal feeling is it's kind of early in the season to really get a good gauge, and you know, one of the things. Um, I think to consider the fact that the village charges $50 for their day pass. And, um, you know, I thought it was appropriate to really be commensurate with what the village <laughs> charges. Uh, and on the topic of beach parking, I would like the board to consider uh, reinstating the uh, Atlantic Avenue day pass parking there as well uh, going forward. That's something that we suspended during COVID. Um, because of the um, additional occupancy restrictions, but uh, given, this, given the position we're in right now, I think it's appropriate to reopen that lot for day passes. At when would you want to start that? In July 4th weekend or just before that weekend? Well, I think we normally would have had it open by now um, and available. Again, it's only available during the week, if I recall correctly. I wouldn't change that. Uh, that regulation. 
It's only available during the week or the weekend? Just during the week. Just during the week. It's resident only weekends. Okay. For for that parking lot. Correct. All of okay. Yeah, parking permit. I, I'm supportive of reinstituting uh, uh, Atlantic Avenue. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit different from downtown Montauk compared to the village because there's other parking in the road right of ways that are in the immediate downtown Montauk central business area compared to the residential areas of Lily Pond and those areas that are, are already restricted. Um, uh, it, it was something that they were pretty f fierce on uh, in their rec in recommendations, just to let you know. Um, any other board members? Um, um, I, I, I wish I'd come to your meeting, David. Um, yeah, well. <laughs> Am I welcome anytime? <laughs> um, I, I'm conflicted a bit. I'm thinking that we should keep it at $50. I, I, I agree that we're not in the heart of the season yet. And, um, you yeah, know, I, I, you know, let me think about it, but I, I don't, I, I, it's something I have to think about. Sorry. I think, uh, you know, one, one other thing to consider is that you know, there are, and always have been areas in the downtown where there's no limit on on the parking. And you're that close to the you know, There probably should be some consideration as to limiting the time for parking uh, in some of those locations. I agree. I think you know. I, I would like to take a deep dive. I have already taken a deep dive. I know Jameson knows this into downtown Montauk parking. There's a lot of areas mm -hmm. in the town code that overlap that you have to be straightened but that's more for the fall so anyway that's one of the recommendations uh, i i'll send it to the board and uh maybe we can uh you know check the emails and see what the board wants to determine i can discuss it again next week um so can also, i say that yeah. i attended both last month's and this month's montauk cac and um and they you know made very strong cases for parking and i would support 50 dollars at atlantic avenue beach because couldn't park on any nearby roads because there's no parking there, but I would support $35 at Montauk so that uh, if folks, um, you know, it, it's a little bit friendlier than, uh, and we're not driving folks to park in the IGA parking lot or, you know, on the street. So. Yeah, I just wonder if Montauk's not so busy this summer that there's not going to be any parking anyway on the street and, um, you know, we're we're actually encouraging, you know, people that might go elsewhere, overcrowding the area. But I, you know, I, I'm not hard and, and fast on it. I'm, I'm certainly open to what the CAC members have. I didn't hear their arguments for it so much, but um, I have in the past been liaison Montauk. And I know that, you know, one time they wanted the lot free uh, thinking that would alleviate the issue, and it really, it really didn't. And before that, it had been, I think, ten dollars, and that that's going back, I don't know, what, twenty, twenty-five years, maybe. Um, Thirty-five dollars. Uh, that lot was full all summer long, and um, I don't, I don't know that it's going to be a deterrent this summer to have it at fifty. Uh, and you're going to always have that spillover. When that lot fills up, people are going to try and find somewhere else to park anyway. So I don't, I don't know. Open to, open to, uh, re, you know, discussing it further and maybe coming up with a different plan. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on it? I'm a little torn, actually. Um, um, my initial inclination was, yeah, go back to $35. It just seems a little more user friendly. Um, and that may be where I come out on this, but I, I think we probably should watch it for a little bit longer and just see how it, you know, how it plays out. Um, it, it hasn't been that long. We're really sort of in the very, very beginning. So I think I'd just like to have a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more evidence about, about how, what the result is of that raised fee. We're going to be flipping the switch. <laughs> I know pretty soon. That, exactly. But I mean, if that, if that lot ends up with a bunch of empty spaces, when it gets busy, then we'll know that we need to make an adjustment. And it's just the only done for resolution. So I want to just let you know those, those. So 
uh, everyone's chimed in. Let's think about it. You might hear from more, more members of the public, but the, there's a lot more to be discussed from the Montauk CAC. Oh, uh, gosh. <laughs> uh, so Mont Montauk was busy this week. It was hot, really hot. And I, I want to thank all the girls at the at all the dance recitals this weekend. You guys, you girls, look, and the boys, actually, you guys look great. It was wonderful. And the parents for sitting out there and, and the Gosman family for allowing the, the this one dance trip to be out there. It was hot uh, and busy. Uh, and meaning the beaches were full. Uh, and there was discussions about Dish Plains uh, Comfort Station and some TLC needed there. Uh, and uh, Buildings and Grounds went out there first thing this morning. They power washed and are cleaning that Comfort Station, getting it ready for, for summer. Uh, and that's moving forward. Uh, the, the main thing that we did discuss was the status of the beaches right now in Montauk. After the memorial, it, it had very, the status of the beaches were Good and bad. Let me explain that there. Uh, they haven't really healed up over the winter time. Being a lot of be a lot of beach hasn't accreted onto the shorelines right now, specifically at Dish Plains, it, uh, Plain Beach. It started to heal a little bit, and then downtown Montauk, we had the stabilization made and it's done and completed at a cost of over seven hundred thousand dollars. But the Memorial Day storms came in and pretty much wiped. Uh, uh, wiped anything that and, and scarped anything that was at Dish Plains off the beach and it's directly down to hard pan. And the same happened in downtown Montauk in which now there are gaps from the bottom of the stairs through. Uh, if you don't mind me just sh uh, just sharing with the board a couple of photos, just specifically a ditch that I took uh, from, from, I believe it was Friday, it was out there Friday wow. also. This is, this is the hard pan at, at Ditch looking west. Mm. Uh, I mean, I lived in Eastbourne, England with my wife on the English Channel. The English Channel is more inviting to this, those beaches, and those are all just cobble. This is actually now looking looking west, sorry, looking east out, uh, towards ED40. It's just hard pan. And why I want to show you this is, is it's a it's two part discussion. There was a lot of this concrete that was on the on the beach, and also uh, legacy concrete, and also metal posts that were put into the hard pan. I discussed mm -hmm. this with Peter, and Peter had a great idea. Let's get it removed while we have the chance. And uh, we never got it down this hard pan. So today, Buildings and Grounds was out there. They removed all the metal posts, which was going to be for, uh, you know, for, uh, for injury and a lot of the concrete that was on on the beach. And this is how much they removed off the beach at that time. So we we took we took the opportunity to 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 move that. And Peter, thanks for the suggestions on that. So we removed that from Ditch Plains, but there's still an underlying issue there is that it's it, the lifeguards are not um, not using that beach as a, a guardable beach because of the conditions of the beach for the lifeguard stand. And this was discussed in great length with the CAC and they put a resolution through that, that passed unanimous, unanimously that the East Hampton Town Board take immediate action to put appropriate high quality beach sand at Dish Plains to enable Dish Plains to return to a lifeguarded beach. So they would like to see, like as we did, I believe it might have been 2003, uh, a type of maybe 2012. I, I apologize. I think it was 13. 2013. 2013. Yeah. And Ken, yeah. Sylvie and I were uh, went on the board then. Yeah, and it was bad. It looked just like that. Actually, it was a little worse at that time because there was even more debris, uh, concrete and metal and whatnot there that was clean. We made the bit of an effort to clean up what we could then so yeah well that that, that was uh, the recommend they are, are, are pressing the board like the board to, to do so to take immediate action uh you know specifically so that the beach can be ready for the july 4th weekend knowing of mobilization uh and to try to find where the sand might be some through some of the purveyors uh, I, I i i'm supportive of taking some type of action uh, I think we would, I've reached out to Kim Shaw to get her recommendations on this. And also on Friday, particularly when I was out there Friday afternoon, um, we, I went down to South Edison to see where the vehicular put on was. And that's where these concrete blocks are that had completely fallen off. And I met with one of the Marine patrol officers, extremely dangerous down there. Uh, I actually made the executive decision and we got 30 yards of sand put down there just to cover it because it was. It was a public safety issue, uh, but it, it was a drop in the bucket compared to what we might need to do for some of the overpasses. So I, I think I want to have Kim Shaw write to the board about some of the recommendations on what we can maybe look look to do. And then, of course, 
there's a uh, there's there's an availability of SAM, availability of contractors, and availability of funding, also yeah. too. Uh, so with all those mo moving forward, I just wanted to let the board know this. And I don't know if you, if there's any discussion you want to have on this right now. Yeah, I would support finding out all of those things that you just said. You know, availability of SAM funding and you know ability to move it there. Um, I, and talking with Kim Shaw, if there are any you know, natural resources, um, input, environmental input that we need to consider. Uh, I, I think it's an important beach um, for us. And, you know, uh, th thank you, David. Yeah, it, I've been monitoring it for a couple of months now. And I've talked to some of the property owners on the beach there that have oceanfront homes on the beaches down there. And they, we thought it was coming back, but after after this storm, I I I I don't think the prevailing winds are going to go southwest soon enough. I'm I'm hesitant, to, I'm comfortable saying that they're going to change for us to get a healing of the beach that we we would mm. need to continue having this as one of our major tourism and economic drivers. Also, yeah, I'd, I'd be uh, in favor of trying to do something, provided that we you know use our resources like Kim Shaw and figure out you know if it's appropriate and how to do it, price it. Um, I agree that Ditch is, uh, it's an iconic beach and very important to Montauk. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's the most popular local beach in Montauk uh, for local families and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we've seen this scenario before and um, it's probably unlikely at this point that we'll see the sand return um, to the, Degree we would like prior to the Fourth yeah. of July. And it's still possible, but um, you know the one thing that's very different about Ditch than downtown Montauk is that we don't have a standing replenishment permit in place, uh, to my knowledge. And so to you know to get through and make sure that we can um, you know provide the sand in this location, the logistics of it, I think we can we can figure out, and we'll be you know, continuing uh, our pursuit of that with the natural resource department to ensure that we're doing everything that we're supposed to do and um, try to get that beach back in shape. Yeah. Well, I'll continue. Yeah. Oh, Kathy, go ahead. I apologize. No, I was just going to say, you know, I support this, you know, bringing sand down there as, as well. And, and also just the concern for public safety, you know, uh, that, People are going to swim down there, regardless. You know, Peter, you just said it's one of the most pop. It is the most popular, you know, beach for for locals. And regardless of whether there's a lifeguard or not, people are going to go in the water. So we need to rectify that quickly too. And one of the issues, and when I talked to John Ryan about the fact that John Ryan Jr. that they weren't <laughs> going to be guarding that beach Memorial Day weekend, and thankfully it really wasn't an issue because the weather was so terrible. Uh, but they can't even safely put a guard stand there. That was one of the bigger issues. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if we just need to put sand down there in a big pile <laughs> to hold the stand in place, you know, at a bare minimum, we could do that. Um, but uh, you can see the condition. It's not great right now. So it would be, it would be great to get it back to uh, what it needs to be to really have a safe and enjoyable location as soon as possible. Well, I'll continue to work forward on that. I'll keep the board apprised of conversations I have with Kim, knowing that timing is the essence of this. And um, we'll, we'll move for, forward on that. But I want to make sure you, you knew what the Montauk CAC was looking into. and Also get those pictures out to everyone if you hadn't been out to the beach yet. Uh, also from the CAC, we discussed uh, the Montauk Village Association. Uh, had a dis uh, uh, There's a request in for removing some of the shrubs around the gazebo and replanting some of the shrubs there. We discussed that with uh, the, the Montauk Village Association put that request and we discussed at the Montauk CAC last night. Uh, they were supportive of this as long as uh, everything's looked at as far as uh, uh, the, the plan to revegetate the area, also looking to the wood. There's been some issues with um, people resting or sleeping in those areas and, and, and just an area to, uh, for trash collection. But what we're going to do is we're going to get a long range plan detailed and uh, and one of the representatives from the MBA was on the call last night. She's going to discuss it with the organization and, and possibly do this now instead of the middle of the season, look into doing this at the end of the season as far as a long range uh, change there. But maybe cut the, some of the strawberries down just to get into a little bit more manageable height. So that was some of the discussion. Paul Monte assisted with that discussion also. Yeah, good. Um, 
there was a <laughs> excuse me discussion of the Montauk advisory Montauk um, excuse me the subcommittee for the airport they want to continue making sure that priority was for to have the Montauk diversion study uh, uh, enacted and moving forward and I told them that we were having that on our priority list to move forward with the diversion study so I want to make sure the board was aware of that um, let me see I, I one other uh, act Action right now. This is about public access and public beach access. This goes back to the Sea View case that was in Napeague. The town was given an order to show cause that had a temporary restraining order in which the town has to appear on, on June seventeenth. Uh, part of the, the restraining order is that is that there is no vehicular or beach driving allowed in the four thousand linear feet of the Napeague beachfront area. Uh, that will be either uh, that would be. Uh, enforced by the town's enforcement agencies. If you have any questions on that, please contact the enforcement agencies of the town at 537-7575. Uh, and as we have any changes to that, we will let you know. But for right now, there's no vehicular driving in any of the areas that involve the Sea View case. Um, I wanna say one thing to my, my family, my wife, uh, and also the residents and to the board members. If you have to choose between being kind and being right, Choose being kind, and you will always be right. For this, I want to apologize to the people I just mentioned for my loss of decorum last last week at our town board meeting. Um, I, I really truly apologize for that. But at the same time, I don't uh, I don't have any uh, anything against any of the words that I use or I said, just the way that I said them. And I want to make sure that I could defend my character from any insinuations or or such. But I really apologize for my, my loss of decorum. I will always try to choose to be kind because I know that will make me right. And that's my lead. Thank, thank you, David. Sonia? Yeah, thank you, David, for saying that too. Um, yeah, sometimes we can get provoked and it's not necessarily the best of us comes out. So um, I, I agree with you, David, always be kind. Um, the business recovery group met. Uh, we did uh, get the numbers from Robert Ross uh, on the COVID patients that are in the hospitals on Long, uh, in Suffolk County. So Southampton Hospital has two patients. Um, Eastern Long Island has none. And Stony Brook has 35. So they're starting to see this trend going down. He did have zero for a couple of days at Southampton. Um, so that's, that's all good news. Uh, just want to say that you know you can still get your vaccine every day if you go to Stony Brook uh, Southampton campus. It's open from eight until six p.m. And right now you don't need to have uh, um, an appointment, but if you'd like one, they can also give you an appointment. Um, we just got an email from Joanne. Um, this is in response to something that we asked for at. Um, uh, at the last meeting. And so we want to know the second round of um, uh, Moderna vaccines were given, uh, well, the first rounds were given four weeks ago. Now the second round is coming up at the Montauk Playhouse. And um, so the, so Robert Ross and Southampton Hospital have said that if you, um, so the second round is gonna be uh, Thursday from four to 8 p.m. If you still want your first vaccine, you can get it that day as well. And your second vaccine will be given um, by the Dr. Uh, Jenneru that's, and I hope I'm saying his name right, at Meeting House Lane. And you would get that dose four weeks later. So we're still trying to work on making sure, in particular, folks that are working in um, Montauk are vaccinated and that would like the, the vaccine. So you can get your first dose, even though it's for the second round at the Montauk Playhouse and you'll get it the second dose at uh, uh, Meeting House Lane doctor's office. And that's this Thursday from four to eight. Exactly. Um, the business recovery group did discuss um, the communications group uh, or the communications firm that was hired. We talked about um, their messaging and how important it was for the town of East Hampton. One of the members said uh, it was, they were very clear, it was very concise, and it was something that was needed at the time and that they felt it was um, money well spent. The other issue that came up was the Southport commuter connection, which we would like to emphasize um, to Fred Thiel that we would like to see come back. 
I did have a conversation with Fred. I don't think this is going to be a conversation until after summer. But uh, anyway, they do want to know, and we will send us a letter of support, um, hopefully from the town, in order to get the um, South Fork Community Connector back. Uh, they also asked to talk to Kevin Cooper, who is our new um, head of code enforcement. Uh, Kevin um, is going to be at our meeting on the 16th. So uh, he couldn't make it this Wednesday, so he'll be there on the 16th. He's also reached out to Paul Monte, the chamber, which was um, something Paul had asked for, if he could talk with Kevin. I've also had Kevin in my office as a conversation about um, uh, the leaf blower and you know, sending out or you know, stopping and, and, and giving people the information in both Spanish and English. So they, they will be continuing to do that so that people understand what the legislation is all about. And he also has been walking the, um, the commercial districts and handing his card out to anybody, any of the owners at any of the businesses. He was uh, in Montauk last week. He's doing Amagansett this week. So I really wanna commend um, our new code enforcement for, again, good communication is what I think we really need throughout the town and thank him for doing that. Uh, the Wayne Scott CAC also met and we had Kim Cordy was there um, from the Peconic Land Trust and she gave an overview of Il Molina, the restaurant that's there that um, was purchased. And we talked quite a bit about the generous gift by Kathy Rayner. Um, in order for Peconic Land Trust to purchase that property, to demolish the building that's there and to pull out um, the septic systems that they were pretty sure are still in water um, and restoring that to its natural state. There will be two parking spaces there. It's just gonna be a very passive use. There will be a platform um, that's towards the water that will be for viewing. So you can see um, Georgia Capond in that area. And they also thank the town board for their generous gift. Um, Sarah was also, Sarah Davison was also on the call um, and working with the rain, getting sure that there's a rain garden at the um, launch for, uh, it's the rest stop, but for the launch for um, uh, kayaks. And we think working those, those two properties together is gonna have a big improvement. Um, on the water quality of Georgia Capon. So it was, it was good to have Kim on the call and uh, thanked her for being there. Uh, I also talked to them, we are gonna be hiring and soon. We have a resolution this afternoon for the town board to consider on hiring Lisa LaCurry, Dotson and Flinker and Ray DeBias of McLean and Associates um, for uh, working with the CAC I mean, working with the Hamlet study, including members of the CAC, um, in implementation, and so they were happy to hear that. I've also spoken with Steve Lynch about trees on Main Street. Um, the Wayne Scott CAC formed a committee, a tree committee, and so there, um, my conversation with Steve was that we need to come to him to talk about species of trees, the correct trees that should be um, planted in the town's right-of-way, and um, whether or not there are overhead wires depends on the type of species that are also um, the town would like to plant in the tree in the um, road right of ways. Uh, Carolyn had also, um, Carolyn Gluck, who is the chair, had also written to Steve Lynch and thanking him for his cleanup at Beach Lane where they had cleaned up all the signs, any sand, they had um, repaved that whole area. And so she thanked him, also thanked Tony Lippman. Uh, there was a request during the week that uh, from uh, the CAC that the sign that said unguarded beach had been taken down. So they asked for a new sign to be up and Tony got to it right away. And so now they are complete at the end of Beach Lane. We did talk about, um, and I told the group that we were having a work session um, on June 15th on the airport issues. Two issues were gonna come up. One was gonna be about airport air quality. The other was going to be about the current conditions um, from the planning perspective, planning department, the zoning, the water recharge overlay districts, et cetera. Um, there was uh, some um, concern, particularly from one committee, uh, not she wasn't a committee member, she was a member of um, uh, that has uh, I guess ties with the, um, a group for 
the airport. And she was very concerned that, um, and repeated it often, that there wasn't enough time between that meeting on Saturday and June 15th to have big participation. Uh, she had been present on the last participation that we had with Cooley and Associates and HRNA and HMMH when they presented their uh, findings on the airport the economic study and the complaint study. And she said that she didn't feel there was enough time or nor enough participation in that particular meeting. And she thinks that we needed more time to get this right. Um, they also have an airport subcommittee and their airport subcommittee is looking at uh, several issues, quality of life, noise, environmental impacts, and opportunities that may or not be possible at the airport as we continue. They also had a presentation from one of the members on the gun club lease. And um, you know there was no recommendation there, just some information that was given to the town board. Uh, and Last but not least, they said June 20th from two to four is the Strawberry Festival. So it will be at the um, Sewing uh, Serval Society's building from two to four. So I hope everybody shows up for a bowl of strawberries. Uh, the um, uh, Energy Sustainability Small Group met. We are going, we're starting to work on our balloon legislation, uh, which would ban helium field balloons in the township. Uh, the stretch code is going to be heard um, uh, as a public hearing on the 17th. We would like a, an RFP presentation, uh, and Jeannie Carosa may um, give us the information first, but we may have a work session, hopefully we have time for one. Uh, on green heating and cooling, this is a resolution that we hope that with this RFP that we'll get feedback to um, work with and expand our, our Energize East Hampton program to not only include solar, but now to include uh, green heating and cooling. And street lights were also discussed. Uh, we are trying to partner with Sag Harbor, who is anxious to partner with us, and, and NIPA on our street light upgrades to LED. Uh, this would be sh a shared services agreement that we would have, and it will be a significant cost reduction if we do it with shared services. We have a proposal already um, sketched out with Sag Harbor and East Hampton. We also have talked with NIPA about cost savings and energy savings if we switch out to LED. And um, I've asked for a work session agenda for July 13th so that we can go through um, with NIPA, with Sag Harbor, and with um, Polytechnic Institute, um, which in Rensselaer, um, New York, so that we, they will also be on the call so they can discuss with us any engineering and any um, information that we need to understand LED lighting and, and with street lights. Uh, the leaf blower conversation, I think we've already had, so I don't need to repeat that. And uh, that's it that I have for today. Thank you, Sylvia. Jeff, do you have a liaison report for us? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, the airport. Um, we do have a draft um, a report on carbon emissions at the airport. It's, it's, uh, it's actually not unduly long. It's less than 20 pages, and it's, um, it's kind of interesting. It's uh, both a top-down uh, analysis, in other words, like a comparison of comparable towns, and then what they call a bottom-up analysis, which looks at the specifics of East Hampton. And I think we've, we've mentioned that there's a disparity between the amount of uh, greenhouse gases produced at the airport and the percentage population that produces those greenhouse gases. Um, I circulated the, uh, actually council circulated that report May 13th, and we've asked for comments. We haven't gotten any comments from the town board. Um, and I actually followed up May 27th and asked for comments and no one had any comments on it. So uh, I want to emphasize to anybody who's listening to this that, you know, when, when we're talking about these reports and this revisioning process, they're all preliminary reports. They're, they're draft reports. They're not, it's not like, uh, as I've said before, that it's not like the Ten Commandments carved in stone. We're, we want to... Uh, try to put something on the table that will help guide the conversation 
um, and give people some facts to think about, some facts that they may disagree with, some facts that they may agree with, and that every time we hold one of these sessions where people can come in, um, our practice has been that we will allow people to come and comment on anything that's been produced as a topic along the way. So it's not like you have one opportunity on one day to look at the uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions report. Um, uh, it's an ongoing process and people could return. I just want to make sure that um, that was understood. Um, we, we, are, we do have a short period of time until uh, the grant assurances at the airport expire. But as I've said many times before, that's not a drop dead deadline. We don't have to uh, close the airport. We don't have to maintain the status quo. We can, we can you know, maintain the airport and we have a little flexibility on, uh, on what we have to do. Um, I'd like to get this report um, on our website. I think um, it, it, it's in shape to be seen by the public, but I need to hear back from the town board uh, that there are no comments on it. I looked at it again today and it's it's quite interesting actually. And I think um, they're very informative. I think the public will, will benefit by uh, taking a look at it. Um, I would prefer to go forward uh, on June 15th. I think, Kathy. Oh, no, you're not. I'm sorry? No, I was just could gonna just, ask. Could we just to... hold till I, till I finish? Sure. Um, I, I would prefer uh, to go on the, on June 15th as we planned and agreed, uh, but if that's not the consensus of the board, it's it's not the consensus of the board. Um, and um, uh, I've been in touch with Lisa Lacoury, who is working on the document that Sylvia described, which is more of a zoning and planning document. I'm really, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'm really delighted to be working with Lisa. Uh, I've known her many, many years, 25, 30 years I've known her. She does great work. And, um, you know, she, I, I checked in with her and she's on target to uh, have it prepared before uh, the 15th. If we don't have the meeting then, um, I'd like to certainly get the documents posted on that day. Um, and that's all I have on the airport. So Kathy, I didn't mean to cut you off from commenting. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's hard doing these meetings um, via Zoom because sometimes, you know, those of us, we take a breath or we just pause and we think that that's an opening and there's a, a delay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I can't wait till we can uh, meet in person because I think um, our interactions uh, will change. Um, I think what would be helpful for this report is the experts, um, you know, his uh, resume or, you know, some write up about who it is that we've, you know, contracted with to do this carbon and air quality emissions report for the town. I think that's missing in this, Jeff. I think that that will, you know, when people read it, it'll give it context when they know, um, you know, the background on the folks that did the study for us. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. He's uh, quite qualified. The town board has seen his resume, but yeah, we can uh, attach it to the report. Um, he's uh, he's a highly qualified person in a very interesting field. And re 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 reading the report is kind of fun. It's amazing how they can analyze, how they can get their arms around this, da this data. So yeah. What I've heard is, you know, because we've, you know, told folks now that we're, we're going, we did a carbon and air quality emissions, and then there's just been a lot of questions back. Well, um, why haven't you tested the soil or, you know, other, you know, there were other asks. So maybe we also want to put it in context as far as, you know, what environmental testing we're doing and what we're not recommending at this time. And maybe our, you know, our attorneys had given us know input on that so maybe it needs to be flushed out like that as far as is this the only environmental analysis that we're doing or is there you know going to be additional analysis i think putting it in that in that context would be helpful too yeah there was discussion about doing analysis of um soil and air testing and there are um serious limitations about what that kind of testing would produce and the the difficulty of doing it and um, whether or not the results uh, would be, would, would move, move the discussion forward. Um, 
And uh, I think probably the attorney and this air quality uh, expert may be a better position to talk about that a little bit than, I mean, I understand why, what, why we've made the decisions that we did. Um, you know, sometimes you think if you just scoop up some dirt and subject it to spectrographic analysis, you're going to come up with something that really helps you move the ball forward. But it's a little more complicated than that. And um, certainly the greenhouse gases are a major concern uh, at the airport. I think that's something that everybody knows we need to find out more about. But I agree with you that we could have some discussion on that. And I'll, I'll try to, I'll talk to the attorneys and, and to, to the professor about it. And I'll get his resume um, out. If there are no substantive comments on his um, study, I'd like to you know, post it on the website as soon as possible, whether or not we go forward on June 15th, might as well get it out. Um, I don't think, the planning report may not be done till the end of the week. So that may take a little longer. As long as for me, as long as it's a complete package and there's, you know, context and his credentials and everything. Yes, sure. Yeah, I, I, he, he, I will say um, it's not, it was, it's, it, it was not easy to find an expert, you know, with this, who's capable of doing this. A lot of them are, are working for airlines and industry, are industry experts. Um, and so we took, you know, we got to an academic that, you know, studies it uh, from an environmental standpoint. And, and uh, I think uh, people that see the resume and the report will find both of them quite interesting. Um, I also wanted to talk about, oh, also, I, I wanted to mention that another uh, document that was sent around, there were some questions, um, mostly by airport opponents, uh, saying that we didn't break out jet traffic uh, you may remember that there was sort of continuing comments. And, and in the document that, that was sent by council uh, May 13th, uh, there's a very short document of, uh, by HMMH that does exactly that. It breaks out jet traffic to the extent that we have data on it. Doesn't change any conclusions, but it also will be of interest to the public. So that was so, distributed. So has that already been posted, Jeff? No, no, because I, that was one of three documents that, Council circulated to us May 13th, and we were asking about comments on them. There were three documents in that. Yeah. Yeah, you may have missed that, but it was there. No, um, one, so was, one, one was a correction of HMMH report. The other was um, this update of an ask that they said could be done yes. pretty easily, and so right. they, they did. Yeah, um, and the third one escapes me right now. So the third, the third one was the uh, the uh, greenhouse gas report. They were all in one email. Oh, they were all in one email. Yes, so I email. don't have any problem with correcting what's up there with HMMH or putting the add-on to um, what was asked at the public hearing or, or the public um, forum um, on which aircraft were which when right. in a in a complaint. It's, section of HMMH, so. Okay, I would like to hear back from everybody about the um, greenhouse gas report, because if there are no problems with it, other than adding the resume, which is easy, uh, we can get that up quickly. And I think it's, you know, sooner is better. Yeah. Can I ask another question on the airport that Cooley referenced when, we, when they talked about our options, that there were three or four you know, airports that had closed and then reopened with different conditions. And I know that the folks at AMAC had been asking Cooley to get those examples out. And yeah, yes, they, you know, um, Bill had said that he would, and I haven't seen those examples. Um, I've, I've spoken to Bill. We've actually exchanged uh, an email on that. I intended to address that to AMAC directly in Friday's meeting. Um, I think uh, when Arthur asked the question, he was under the impression that they were talking about legal cases like litigation cases or case law decision. And I already spoke to Arthur and said, that's not, that's not what he was talking about. Um, there are, you know, there, there are a few, exam a few examples of um, pr uh, public use airports uh, that are operated privately, basically. And Bill used the phrase, there are a couple of cases where we have these airports. And I think Arthur took that to mean, oh, there's litigation or court authority on it. I did talk to Arthur about that. And I think we'll have a discussion on that on Friday. 
it, it may be less, you know, it, it, there may be less there than meets the eye is what I'm saying. I, I think he thought it was a much more significant comment than it was. So, so your AMAC meeting is this Friday? I believe it is. Yeah, I have to confirm that. I think it's this Friday. Um, I wanted to just mention, oh, I wanted to mention um, LTV uh, is very excited because they, um, they received an award from the Alliance for Community Media Foundation, uh, an award called the Hometown Media Award. And it's... Um, uh, they took first place. There were a thousand entries. It was nationwide and East end underground uh, was the first place winner. And there's going to be a virtual awards cer ceremony on June 30th. They're very excited about it. I know we all love East end underground and it's been a popular show. And it's one of the ways you can really access our very talented local musician community. And uh, I mean, it's, this is not just a little pat on the back award. This is a serious, there was some serious competition. So I wanted to give them a shout out. It's uh, it really shows, you know, how well they're doing, I think. And that, and we, and the proof is in the production, frankly, the show is fabulous. And I love watching it with those great performers. Um, East Hampton, Sag Harbor, CAC met, they did a road cleanup. You, we've already dealt with some of these issues here. Uh, they, they too were concerned about leaf blowers and understanding what the new law said. Um, they're in support of the uh, Akabonic uh, weight limits and um, we're, are happy to, we're happy to know that it was on the agenda uh, today. And I think that's about all I have for today. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, David mentioned status on that big beach and enforcement. Uh, you know, we are in a situation where um, we need to seek further clarification from the judge in the case as to what exactly uh, we will be enforcing. Does the judge believe that things go back to uh, the reservations that were held out in the Benson uh, deeds, which included an ongoing exclusion for fishing and uh, nets and that sort of thing on the beach. Um, and also it's unusual for enforcement to try to enforce pub, uh, private parking violations. Uh, you can't do it in a private parking lot, for instance, if somebody's parking there going somewhere else, uh, the police don't come write tickets on private property. There is a uh, trespass, but you know, delineating where the property lines are alleged to be and um, creates a number of problems. So uh, as David said, I believe we're back in court on the 17th of June. And until such time, we are asking people not to drive uh, at this section of beach. And um, until we get further clarification, uh, I just want everybody to know that uh, my own personal opinion is that uh, we need to take every step necessary in order to ensure our traditional beach access rights, no matter where they are within the township. And I'm committed to using every possible means to do so. Uh, but in the interim, we're asking that you just um, be patient and comply until we get further clarification and uh, chart our next, uh, our next steps in response to that. Uh, we have an opportunity uh, to take advantage of an EV electric vehicle charging grant. It's a rolling grant, so there is some time sensitivity. And, uh, you know, optimally, what we would uh, discuss this very soon. I know we have some very busy and full uh, work session agendas uh, coming up. So uh, I just want to sort of preload the conversation if I can. Um, and I'll just share a screen. So there's been some discussion and review by L.K. McLean, our town uh, engineers, and presenting a potential plan for battery storage, solar arrays, and charging along the west border. If you look here on the uh, shared screen, we are here in the town hall complex. And uh, if you look towards the rear of the property along this left side, the western border, there's room for additional EV charging, as well as uh, solar arrays and battery storage to complement that. Um, so 
uh, I hope that the board will support applying for this grant moving forward. Um, we already discussed the daily passes at Atlantic Avenue Beach, and I believe the, uh, the board members were supportive of reinstating those. And do we have uh, the number we, we had in mind was $50 a day for day pass there? Uh, commensurate with what the village charges and what we're charging in Montauk. And uh, if there's no objections, we'll go ahead and move forward on doing that. Any comments on that topic? No, I have no objections to opening up for the day pass at that rate in Atlantic. I just, I, I still think at 35 in Montauk would be more appropriate based on the location. I understood, David, and I think that's something we'll continue to discuss and monitor and, you know, that might be the end result here. Um, so I appreciate you bringing us the concerns of the CAC members and uh, I know the board members are all thinking about that and we'll consider it. Um, that's really what I have today. We have a, a hard stop in our exec session. I know there are a number of items that we need to get to. So let's move on to resolutions and uh, I, I have a hard stop at three. So we're kind of getting tight on time. Okay, so resolution 2021-704 is a status change from part-time to seasonal. This is for our student intern, Nick Liris, and he's going to be going to 40 hours a week, and 50% uh, of it will be funded from the town attorney's budget and 50% from the town board's budget. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye, Pastor Kerry. 705 is approval of various special event permits. One is for the uh, Montauk Skate Park Renovation and Information Fundraiser the, at the skate park this Saturday, 612 from 12 to 5 p.m. And then for the offshore sports marinas, Blessing of the Fleet is this Sunday, 613 from 7 to 10 p.m. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passing period. I can't believe the Blessing of the Fleet. Is, is here already and you know yeah. was, kind of missed it last year. Seven, Reso 706 is an authorized emergency repairs to portions of Harbor View, Harbor View Drive that are a, the urban renewal parcel. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carried. Resolution 2021-707 is um, Extend agreement with Fine Arts and Sciences, Dodson and Plinker Inc., L.K. McLean Associates for the Wainscot Hamlet Study Implementation um, Assistance. Uh, I'm going to read the in financial impact. So the Fine Arts and Sciences, Dodson and Plinker, uh, L.K. McLean Associates shall be paid for such additional work based upon an existing payment schedule and an additional sum in the amount of $86,000 shall be added to the funding authorized by resolution 2019-1382 for the total amount of, um, in the amount of 120,000 for a total authorization in the amount of 206,000. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass and carry. Resolution 2021-708 is a budget modification for the building department and that is moving $730 from travel con uh, conferences and dues to $130 in telephone and $600 to, in office supplies. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Pass and carry. Resolution 709 is to amend resolution number 2021-696, which was to approve a change order number one for the East Hampton Police Department parking lot reconstruction and uh, it's amended uh, the total contract price from 303,127.77 to 113, three, excuse me, $313,046.70. And uh, whereas it inadvertently stated that the utility upgrades for $6,415 paid from Funline are now resolved to the final sentence of uh, let's see, additional casting replacement for $3,504. Second. All in favor? Aye. That's been carried. Uh, any other resolutions to bring before the board? 
I make a motion to go into executive session. I make a motion to move into executive session to discuss the acquisition of real property, to discuss the hiring of personnel in the planning department, and to receive advice from council. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass and carry. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. We will enjoy this beautiful weather, and uh, I'll send the link for exec and momentarily. Thank you. Thank you.